Drugs and alcohol were definitely a panacea for me. I mean, they were the answer to me feeling like a worthless, dirty piece of shit and not belonging anywhere to anyone. And then one day, like with most addiction, so insidious in nature, I woke up and I was fucked. That was my mantra was that everyone else had it better than me and woe is me. And as long as I felt that way, that was gonna be my reality until I could break scarcity mentality and victimhood and take 100% responsibility for everything going on in my life, good and bad, that was when I was able to, at 34 years old, take my first step towards manhood. We're all teaching one another how to be men because a lot of us weren't given the, the proper example of what divine masculine is. You don't get a hundred grand or a million dollars in the bank and all of a sudden you're fixed and you're perfect. This is an ongoing evolution of our soul of our physical being, of our place in society, and you start to breathe differently, you start to think differently, all of a sudden your life starts to evolve into something that is just amazing. My passion, my purpose is to help people to feel the same metamorphosis, miraculous metamorphosis that I felt when I was 33, 34 years old, newly sober, shot out, low energy, fatigued, depressed, anxious, to where I am today, I don't want to live in a cage. I, even if the bars are golden, and even if the bars are, are, you know, fortune and fame, I don't want that shit. I move unencumbered. I'm free. So you picked U2 War out of all the albums that you, you look and you didn't have an opportunity to look at all the albums, but that, that stood out to you. What was it about U2 War? And you kind of mentioned that that's where it was a kind of a turning point for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, music in hindsight was, was one of the things that saved my life. I mean, I was suicidally depressed as a young kid. Um, I suffered horrific shit that no kid should ever go through. And when you're a child and you're experiencing that stuff, you don't know that. So I was going through, you know, witnessing my mother get beaten to within an inch of her life on a regular basis. I was being sexually traumatized by a half brother and by some of his friends in the neighborhood. Um, I went through a terrible, terrible experience with a, my swim coach who was much, much older um, like in his late thirties and just somebody that I totally looked up to and wanted to be like, um, he had the hot girlfriend, he had a couple of kids, he had a cool job. He was like super fit, athletic, tan. And, um, yeah, unfortunately he took advantage of my lack of boundaries and my desperately seeking attention. And, um, it's not that I didn't know it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. It's that why why is this happening to me? And it felt like I was the only one. So everyone else can play catch with their dad in the front yard. All these people like have these like mom, dad, dog, cat, dinner at six families. And my dad's this crazy fucking terrorist guy from Palestine. And my mother's this like weak, frail little woman from Poland and they both speak different languages and they both have different religions. And we're talking about Ohio, you know, a rural little town in Ohio. Um, it was, it, it, I, I just felt incredibly isolated and alone and desperate and depressed and was suffering from what I later learned to be acute panic anxiety disorder, but I didn't know. I was a fucking kid. I didn't read medical books. Yeah. And well, and with let's let's go back to the relationship with the swim coach is was was he in some ways replacing that father figure who wasn't there of course yeah yeah of course and this was repeating in other areas of your life too or i had been sexually abused starting early on you know before i could remember up until the last time which was the swim coach and that was when i was 11 and a after that that's when i just shut down um emotionally and began to act out like really act out. What did act out look like? Uh, vandalism, smoking weed with the older kids in the neighborhood, drinking, taking pills, 
um, acting out sexually. I began experimenting sexually. I lost my virginity when I was 12 years old um, to my next door neighbor, Kim, who was like 15, 16 years old. And um, although it was a great, it gave me great bragging rights as a little kid, it, it didn't feel right. I definitely did not feel good the first time. Um, then after that, then it just sort of became like a way to not feel like myself. And it wasn't, it wasn't one particular thing. It was shoplifting. It was drinking and, you know, smoking cigarettes and taking pills, um, having a bunch of different sexual partners, anything where I didn't have to feel like me. So um, when music crept in and, you know, music was there earlier. I definitely, strangely enough, my first album was, um, a sound of music. I was absolutely obsessed with the sound of music. I know it's, it's bizarre, but, um, I love the sound of music. Queen was my second record. So music definitely was a part of my early, like seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. Um, the Rolling Stones, the one with all the different faces on the album cover, not XL on Main Street, but the one before that. Um, Not Hot Girls or Some Girls. I think it was Some, some Girls, yeah. yeah. So music was there, but, but in, in 1982, um, a bunch of things happened that shifted me from this, like, wanting to die, just fucking hating my life, hating myself, hating the world, hating God. And you're 12, 13 around Yeah. This? Okay. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden there was cable and we had never had cable before. So we went from having three television stations that would turn off at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and the ant races. I don't know if you, if you remember that, but mm -hmm. so, uh, it was terrifying for, you know, for somebody that was suffering from severe. And again, I didn't know I was suffering from panic attacks, anxiety attacks, but I was going through that. And like, I had no coping mechanism. So television was, was great at distracting me. But then when the television would go off and my mother worked nights, I'm all alone. I'm a little kid. I'm 11 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old with no parental supervision. Weekends were great because the older kids in the neighborhood would descend on my house because they knew there was no parents there and the drinking, the drugs, the sex. But during the week, it was, it was hell because I couldn't sleep at night. And um, so cable came out. And that was a, a wonderful solve because all of a sudden there was all these different channels and distractions. MTV was just almost a panacea of sorts. Like it really, it really brought a lot of lever levity to my being. And um, uh, Atari and Activision. Oh yeah, I was an Atari guy. Activision was my rich neighbor had Activision. So my rich neighbor, Teddy Papanigan, got Activision. I got Atari. So now I had Atari, you know, at Teddy's house. It was Activision. I had MTV. And that particular record, I remember when it came out because it was so different from anything, especially in Toledo, Ohio. Like you can imagine in like 83, everything was foreigner. REO Speedwagon. Um, yeah, probably some Journey in there. Journey was huge. Fog Hat, Blue Oyster Cult. Like those were the bands that were constantly playing on the radio. And then all of a sudden, you had U2, War. And the songs were, they were rebellious in their nature. And they were, they were a call to arms. And they were, um, it, it was just something that, you know, Bono's voice and that, and the, the drumming and, and the edges, you know, guitar, there was something innocent and authentic and revolutionary about it. Um, so yeah, that's why I picked that record. Well, I love it, it. As you're describing you too, I recall watching MTV and Sunday, bloody Sunday was like, that was the first video I think they ever put out. Certainly the first one I ever saw. I was like, whoa. And it was this live concert and there was such an intensity. And I didn't understand what it was about, but I knew it was different. Yeah. Like, like who are these guys? And it just like such an anthem. Yeah. You didn't understand what it was about, but you felt what it was about. And, you know, they were talking about the, the struggle going on in Northern Ireland and I think Southern Ireland or whatever it was and the IRA and, you know, all of that. Um, 
they were, they were, I mean, he was bellowing into the mic, a, a war cry of like, you know, none of this is okay. You know, we got to stop the killing. And like, it was just, it was just so real and, and visceral. First video ever played on MTV was video killed the radio star. Yeah. Mm. But at that time, you two, um, Sunday, bloody Sunday, certainly, um, refugee, and then a bunch of other just amazing. I mean, how about like Brian Ferry and Roxy music singing Avalon? You know, that was something that nothing like that had ever been. Well, I'll speak for myself. I don't know about you in Chicago, but Chicago, Chicago's a little. Well, I was diverse. in Maine at that point. Oh, I grew up in Maine. Oh, okay. So sort of similar, <laughs> sort of sheltered, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, I mean, to hear Roxy music um, or like, you know, um, I think the band was called Romeo Void. You remember, I like I might like you better if we slept together. I might like you better if we slept together. You remember that? I'm not recalling. That oh, one. it was it was so good. Or or um, I don't know the name of the band, but um, Mexican Radio. Yes, I'm on a Mexican, Mexican radio. radio. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Yes. I mean, like all of a sudden, like things kind of felt okay. Like my my underlying terror and fear and and PTSD was was just sort of like pushed down enough to where I could almost function and feel like there was a little glimmer of hope and, and watching, watching MTV and ha being able to turn the television on at three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, all that stuff. And look, to be perfect, on, perfectly honest and transparent, drugs and alcohol were definitely a panacea for me. I mean, they were the answer to me feeling like a worthless, dirty piece of shit and not belonging anywhere to anyone. So drugs and alcohol were amazing. MTV, Atari, cable, I mean, and, and, and music really saved my life. It really just like made me feel like at a certain point it was going to be okay. When, where was your dad at this point? Just talk a little bit about your relationship with him growing up. My father, <clears throat> my father at that point um, he left when I was seven and he worked overseas for about eight years. He worked in a different country, just about a year, every year he would work in a different country, Soviet Union and East Germany and Venezuela. Um, not sure where else. Very, very strained relationship. I mean, he was the, the angry monster that beat my mom. So it wasn't like I, I love my dad or missed my dad. Um, I desperately wanted my dad to love me. Um, he would pop in town every six months or so, every eight months. He would show up at the house that he promised my mom that she could have, um, which turns out when I was 15 and he threw us both out, uh, the day before Christmas wasn't true, but he had promised her that she could have that house in the divorce. They used his lawyer in the divorce. That's how gullible my mom was sure. and just how people pleasing my mom was. and. My relationship with him was horrible. I mean, I, I feared him, I hated him, and I also desperately wanted him to love me, which he wasn't capable of doing. My dad had been married or had kids all over the world, in Palestine, in um, Louisiana. There's a daughter that he still doesn't acknowledge. Um, I got a sister in Canada. I have, I have a brother or a sister or both in Chicago. I have a brother in Ramallah. Um, I had a sister in Jordan who passed recently. So my dad had a lot of kids. Holy shit. Yeah. He's like an NBA player. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sort of without the talent or the hype. <laughs> um, how, did, how did all this come to light? Just over the years, you know, I, I, I put it all together kind of like in hindsight, but like, as a kid, I didn't know any of that stuff. I just knew that he didn't love me, that I made his blood boil, that I reminded him of my mom. And he wasn't too bad violently, like physically violent with me. It was the timber in his voice and the volume of his voice that when my dad would scream and he would break shit as well while he screamed. But when my dad started screaming as a child, I, I mean, it's silly. And when I think back, it's fucking sad, but like I would, I'd pray to die. I would just literally like either pray for God to kill him or I would pray to die. 
or I would wish that he would hit me because at least if he hit me, it would be, it would be quick and it would be over and he would go away. Oh, yeah. But when he screamed, he was a rageaholic. When he screamed, you just had to fucking endure it for hours and hours and he would break everything in the house and then he would disappear again for another six months, eight months, year, whatever. Um, horrible relationship. But you had someone, a father figure that showed up in a different way back then, a guy by the name of Gus. You talk about it in your book. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I speak to Gus every single day. You do? I do, every single day. Tell I- us about him. By the way, in case you didn't know, Khalil has just an amazing book, a memoir called, I Forgot, I forgot to Die. I Forgot to Die. And uh, I had the title. You didn't need to fucking chime in with that. Sorry, buddy. Come on. <laughs> so I'm a little jumpy. I'm a little on edge. Normally, I'm super composed during podcasts. But yesterday, I was watching your friend um, Smiles. What's his first name? Preston. I was watching Preston's Instagram. And I love him. I love everything about him. I, I love following him in, on Instagram. And I'm watching his Instagram and he's singing and I'm looking in the background and you can see this person, but their head's cut off. And I'm looking at all the different people trying to figure out which ones I recognize. And then all of a sudden the head's not cut off anymore. And it's the, the dude from Entourage, like the ridiculously hot- Andre. Bru- I mean, Andre, Adrian. Adrian, yeah. Andre. <laughs> the ridiculously- That's his new name, fucking Andre. <laughs> the ridiculously hot Adrian, aka Andre- and I'm like, what the fuck? And then, and then I'm like looking and then I go on another, now I start snooping on, on um, Preston's Instagram and then I see a couple more pictures. So then I click on it, which then takes me to Adrian's page, right? And I look on his page and there's a bunch of pictures and then there's one that's a video. So I click on the video and I'm listening to him talk and he's just, he's, first of all, he's unbearably good looking and <laughs> he's so fucking composed and articulate. And then all of a sudden I recognize the books in the background and I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. And I realize he's on your podcast being ridiculously good looking and articulate. And today, which was 12 hours later, I had to fucking show up and try to give my best pitch. And, and so, you've, and you have, no, look I at have you. not. Don't, don't just try to fucking show up as you. No, no one knows you better than you. Even though I've read the book, I still don't know you as well as you do. Well, back to Gus. Yes. I speak to Gus every day. Um, and fuck you, Adrian Brody, if you're listening for being so good looking. <laughs> I love it. Adrian Bro- Grenier. Oh, eight. We're going to is maybe it's Andre Brody. Maybe that's his. New oh, nickname. no, no, no. You're right. You know why I get the two of them confused? Because they're both best friends or I don't know if they're best friends, but they're both really good friends with Rick Rubin and Rick Rubin brought both of them in separately. He brought Adrian, Adrian oh, into Sun Life into Sun Life. He, yeah. he brought Adrian Brody in not, not soon after I'm probably saying that wrong with my dyslexia. He, I watched the piano, I think it was called. And mm. then he had brought in Adrian Brody and it was, you know, you see, you can't swing a dead cat in Malibu without hitting a dead, uh, you can't swing a dead cat in Malibu without hitting a famous person. But when it's somebody like an Adrian Brody, who is such a fucking amazing, amazing actor. I mean, that, that movie, especially because my mom was there and was going through, you know, my mom was in World War II. My mom Ooh. was put into a slave labor camp in Siberia during World War II. So that movie haunted me. So when he came in, I was actually like, rather than starstruck, I was actually like, choked up. Um, and, um, and then Rick later, maybe six months later, walked in with Adrian, Gr- how do you say? Grenier. Gr- Grenier. He's in as a fucking sexy name. Yeah. Prick. Yeah, me. So, um, ruined my life, ruined my podcast. I don't even know what the <laughs> fuck I'm talking about fucking, anymore. <laughs> fucking age elite. Hope I never see that guy. Um, so, um, yeah, Gus was a father figure, um, who owned a restaurant Toledo for, people that don't know, and I wouldn't expect anyone out there to know, but Toledo was a a tiny little town right below Detroit. And it was very mobbed up because of the proximity to Detroit, Chicago, Youngstown, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. So the mob presence in Toledo was far greater than most people ever knew. And 
Gus August Nicolaitis is his real name. Gus um, was a guy who grew up in Toledo. His mother was Sicilian, and his mother was very, very connected to the Detroit mob. In fact, there's this amazing story about when Gus was a little kid, the godfather of the Detroit mafia came to visit Gus's mom. And Gus ran out and said, hey, can I wash your car? You know, being a little kid, like whatever, eight years old, 10 years old, wanting to like make a buck and like people please, I would imagine. And um, he went out and he washed the car. And then when the guy was done eating and visiting with Gus's mom, he came out to see his car and Gus being a little kid, not knowing any better, no. had taken SOS pads and had oh my god cleaned his Cadillac, his brand new Cadillac. No, <laughs> yes. no, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. I thought you were gonna say you gave him like a hundred dollar tip. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> so, as the story goes, he didn't give him a hundred. He gave him fifty bucks, and he let him off the hook. And he just was laughing. He thought it was funnier than shit. I mean, he would just go buy another Cadillac anyway. I mean, these guys. These guys in the Midwest were like larger than life figures. Like what you see on Goodfellas or what you see, like those types of guys lived and lurked around my little town. And I grew up around those guys. And Gus ended up borrowing money from, I wish I could remember the guy's name. I want to say Bassesi. Um, but he ended up borrowing money from the Detroit mob and he opened up a restaurant and he ended up paying them back with vig juice interest whatever um i think 6 months after they opened that's how successful it was yeah so all of these cool underworld figures would hang out there ricky scaviano who was a hitman i can say that cuz he's been dead for many many years um tommy scarface buyers lord knows what he did with those guys but there were these like mythical larger than life figures and i would go in there as a little kid because it was one of my dad's favorite restaurants and it was everybody's favorite restaurant if he lived in Toledo at that time during the 70s. Um, where I'm going with this is on one of the trips back when I was 12, I was breakdancing. Breakdancing had just become popular, 1982. And a kid who I really liked had these bright red Nike tennis shoes with this Velcro strap around the ankle. I'd never seen anything like it before. And he told me they were for breakdancing. They weren't, they were basketball shoes, but I believe they were for breakdancing. So my dad gets into town. My dad does what he usually would do, which would take me shopping because that's how my dad thought he could be a dad and express what he was trying to do, which was love me. So he took me shopping. He got me a bunch of like nice school clothes and tennis shoes and, you know, um, Top siders. I don't know if you remember top siders. Yeah, those, yeah. yeah they looked at kind of like they're for like kind of boat boating shoes. shoes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then a couple of days later, Chris Cook's wearing these red Nike shoes with the with the strap. And I race home and I'm like, I'm like, Dad, Dad, I, I have to get these shoes. And you know, my dad being very Middle Eastern, very Muslim, very like stoic, is confused. He's like, I just bought your goddamn tennis shoes. I'm like, no, 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 no. These are different. And these are for breakdancing and blah, blah, blah. And I have to have them. Oh my God. And my dad's like, I just bought you goddamn tennis shoes. And then the third time when I launched into my petulant stomping of my feet and raising my voice at this man mm. who barely knew me, mm. I have to have these tennis shoes. He beat me. I mean, he really fucking gave me a beating. And then he said, if you want those goddamn tennis shoes, then go get a fucking job. And he got in his car and he left, drove off to, he would always go off to these like fancy supper clubs and drink with his fancy suits on. And um, I refused to talk for like two days. I wouldn't talk because of the beating and because he wouldn't get me the shoes. And to try and appease me or maybe make things nice with me. He took me to the Oak and Bucket because that was my favorite restaurant. I love the spare ribs there. And we go to the Oak and Bucket and we sit down and Gus comes over to say hello. He said hello to everybody. He would just walk around the restaurant, sort of hold court. He was like a movie star, Gus. And uh, he came to our table and he said, hey, Mac, how you doing? He's like, oh, I'm okay. And he's like, what's wrong with your son? And I wouldn't even fucking look up. And he's like, my son wants a goddamn $50 goddamn tennis shoe. My dad loved the word goddamn. 
Um, I thought my middle name was goddamn for a few years there. <laughs> um, and Gus said, so what's the problem? And Gus being like one of those, you know, guys reaches in his pocket and pulls out a fucking fat wad of cash. And he's like, here, kid. And my dad slams his hand on the table when he goes, no, put your fucking money away. And Gus is like, what's, what's the big deal, Mac? The kid wants some fucking shoes. And he goes, yeah, he needs to get a fucking job. I'm 12. <laughs> I'm 5'1", five, five foot one, like 90 pounds. And Gus goes, you want a job? And I look up, just fucking lit up. And I'm like, yes. He goes, I'm serious. Do you want a job? You want to come wash dishes on Friday, Saturday night? I, 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 I practically jumped. I'm like, yes. I was, all right. Be here tomorrow, 4.30. Don't be late. I got there at four. And that night, they put a big giant rubber apron on me. They had to tie it like three times because the apron was bigger than me. <laughs> and I went back in the dish tank in this sweltering hot kitchen and I started washing dishes. And I was good. I was a good little worker, little fucking Polak Arab, you know, five, all five foot one, 90 pounds in me. And end of the night, my mom came, picked me up. Next day, show back up, wash dishes. That night, I went back to Gus's office and I'm like, can I work tomorrow? And he goes, no, you can't work tomorrow. He goes, you come back next Friday. I'm like, yes, sir. And I went to walk out and he goes, hey, kid. I turn around, he pull out a hundred bucks. He goes, here, good job. And I looked at that hundred dollars. You know, I'd work like whatever. He was paying me six bucks an hour under the table. I looked at that hundred dollars and my life changed in that moment. The following day was a Sunday. I walked to Southwick Mall. I walked to the Foot Locker and I got those fucking shoes. And as much as I don't get along with my dad or don't have a relationship with my dad because we don't speak, I fucking love him for doing that. Mm. I love him for doing that. I love, I love the gratitude in, in that. It's um, changed me. It's easy to focus on the, the fucking intense, nasty, raging side of, of our history. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know for me personally, um, my dad wasn't, wasn't quite like that, but there was, there's some, some ang anger, I would say, and some rage and some, some inability to process sadness. It turned into rage or frustration turned into rage. Uh, and I would say just not really understanding how to love mm -hmm. in a way that feels very um, comforting and uh, safe, I would say. Yeah. So I've been kind of sitting with that thing myself. And, um, you know, a good friend of mine took me through a process recently where he put me into that seven-year-old self that was on the receiving end of the rage. Mm -hmm. I said, how did that make you feel? What did you feel in that moment? I said, well, I felt like a fuck up. I felt like I was stupid. I felt like I couldn't get anything right. Like, okay. Now remember, that's not necessarily your dad's intention. Right. That's just how you received it. Now, looking at it objectively, my dad's intention could be, I am so committed to making him the best boy, man I can, yeah. that I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And if I have to yell at him, I'll yell at him. If I have to punish him for whatever, I'll do that. But mm -hmm. I need to make him into the best I can. Now, I don't know if that was his intention. We haven't talked about it. Yeah, I've reached out to him and, and there's, a, there's kind of a hanging text out there right now. Yeah, But my point in all that is as we worked more through the process, it was my response to not feeling like I was lovable mm -hmm. was to try to earn the love by working really hard in school, in sports, and then later in my career. And so I became a high achiever, largely probably because I was driven to earn love mm -hmm. now in the past couple of years i've really worked to decouple from that idea that that's how to earn love but it's hard man i'm 49 right now it's been a lot of years of feeling like that's how i need to earn love from anybody yeah it could be super subtle but there's this 
kind of underlying thing that I'm working to continue to identify and realize that, that that's not it. Love is, it's, it's, it's boundless and it's infinite. And if, if I can just open up to it, then it's available. Mm -hmm. But when I start to put kind of metrics around it of how to earn love and, and this is worth more, like it just, it's a path that I'm trying to, to work through. So I, I, the only reason I say this, is I appreciate that you recognize the gift of your dad making you get a job or you saying yes to getting a job and him not just letting both. Gus peel off. Yeah, both. Yeah. And I, I'm, I don't know. I don't have a relationship with my dad. And so, you know, reaching out to him and asking him what his intentions were, I don't need to. I know what his intentions were. His intentions were that, you know, he came from a hostile, unfair environment. I mean, you, you, people can chime in all day long about what they think is wrong and right in the Middle East and, and you know, who deserves the land and this and that. Let's set all that aside for a moment because all of it is, is conjecture. All of it is what we watched either on Fox or on CNN or what our, you know, teachers told us in school. My grandfather worked for the British government in the postal department. He worked his ass off his whole life and he saved every penny. He was a mean, nasty son of a bitch. But his dream was to have an olive orchard. That was his dream. So when he retired, he bought an olive orchard. And I learned from some of my relatives that he loved those trees more than he loved his own family. He would hug the trees. He had this relationship with these olive trees. And a few years into owning these olive trees on this olive orchard. Um, people came in, soldiers came in, people had guns, there was gunfire, there was, you know, sounds of explosions going on off in the distance. My family ran up into the mountains. After three days, they came down and there were people there that said, this isn't your land anymore. Wrong or right, can you imagine? Let, let's say 1,000% that, that, you know, that the Jewish people deserve Israel and what it doesn't take away from the fact that my grandfather, my dad, his brothers and sisters had to leave. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't steal anybody's land. They bought that land fair and square, saved up his whole life to buy that land. They had to go and live in tents and be refugees, which interesting, you two song. Oh. refugee just put that together um my dad saw that as an 11 year old 12 year old kid my dad got beat by his dad my he, he his dad was so violent that if anybody did something wrong if someone like dropped a glass and broke it he'd beat up the whole family that's how my grandfather was and i actually got that information from other relatives, not from my dad. My dad never really told me much about anything. Um, so my dad at 16 gets married, has a child, has another child, has another child, can't pay the bills, you know, can't get decent work, decides to leave and go to Germany, make some money, and after five years, he leaves Germany and he comes back and his brother had married his wife and had a kid with her. Now, as horrible as that sounds in the Muslim tradition, if a brother dies, it's kind of like the brother's responsibility to take care of that woman and, and make her your, your wife. So my uncle didn't do anything wrong. They thought my dad was gone forever. They didn't realize he was coming back. Again, Perception is reality. Can you imagine going off to Germany, working your ass off, making a bunch of money, coming back, thinking you're going to be a hero and get your wife and your kids and take them back to Germany and you come back and your fucking wife is living with your brother and sleeping in the same bed and has a kid? And then I would say at the, by the same token, imagine being them like thinking like, well, we've, we're committed to one another and he's gone and then he comes back. You're like, what the fuck? Of course. Whoa. So my dad was shown at a very early age that the world was a motherfucker and that life was not fair 
and that people will hurt you and abandon you and harm you. So when my dad was giving me those beatings and my dad was, you know, behaving however he was behaving, I'm confident he felt like he was doing a good job being a, a dad, you know, that he needed to fucking toughen me up. Um, and make sure that I could handle how hard the world was going to be. And in a very bizarre way, he did. He did. He did. My life became super fucked up and I became homeless and, you know, suffered the high cost of low living. Um, I created my own turmoil and strife. I, you know, became homeless on my own. Nobody put a gun to my head and told me to smoke crack and shoot heroin. Seemed like a great idea. I was in a rock and roll band. It seemed like appropriate. You know, Exile on Main Street, Sid Vicious, mm. Jim Morrison. Like, I idolized all those fucking morons. I wanted to be like them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I've never heard those guys called fucking morons. Fucking morons. <laughs> so true i mean not and we can all be morons i'm just i'm not judging here but yeah they were fucking morons jim morrison was born so gifted and so talented he was a young dionysian god perfect body long flowing hair all this amazing god-given talent and what does he do he drinks himself into a blubbering fucking slob stupor heroin addict and dies alone in a bathtub at 27 years old? Are you fucking kidding me? I look at your, your beautiful son out there, mm -hmm. and I can see your strength and your power and your talents in him. I can see the beauty and the wisdom of your incredible wife in him. And if he goes out and does great things, I'm going to pat him on the back, and I'm going to be proud of him. But if he winds up at 27 years old, a fat fucking slob dying alone in a bathtub, I'm going to call him a fucking moron too. Yeah, that's I don't, fair. I don't care. I think that's fair. I, I don't care what Morrison did from 18 to 27. I mean, some of it is some pretty prolific, incredible stuff. But at the end of the day, just like, come on, man. Well, you, I think this is a fucking perfect segue because listen, getting into your story is a series of podcasts. I mean, it's really, it's fascinating. And, and, and again, I mentioned the book before. I Forgot to Die, which is an incredible title. I want to talk about that. Please go out and get it. It is an incredible read. You will most likely read it in one sitting as long as you're not starting too late at night, but you still may make it through the night. It is fascinating. It's, um, dude, each fucking chapter, it seemed like it ended with, and that wasn't rock bottom. I was like, come on, bro. Like, holy shit. So, yeah, you obviously had a different upbringing, right? You weren't Jim Morrison with this super gifted, blah, blah, blah. You had some challenges along the way. But how, is there any way to distill like what happened to put you in that spiral? I'm sure you've told this story a million times. So I'm going to ask you to tell it a million and one here. What's landed for everybody here? Because I want them to go get the book and get, get really get into the nitty gritty of, of your path. but. Well, a dad who was super violent and angry and, you know, definitely did not love me. I mean, that, that doesn't mean that he didn't want to or didn't try, but certainly did not deliver. And a mom who, when I begged her to make my half-brother stop sexually molesting me, shrugged me off, shooed me away and said, he's just tickling you. And when I begged my mom not to let my swim coach take me camping, she let him take me camping. So I had a mom that didn't protect me, didn't love me, abandoned me, neglected me, left me alone. Um, she, in her own right, was you know suffering from her own mental illness. My mom was definitely suffering from Stockholm Syndrome and my dad being the captor. Um, Can you explain that for people who just um, who've heard the term but just aren't exactly sure what it means? Yeah, Stockholm syndrome comes from um, a woman named Patty Hearst, whose father was, I believe, still at that time the richest man in America, and she got kidnapped and held for ransom. And what ended up happening, um, her violent, crazy machine gun toting captors, um, over a period of time, she began to have sympathy for them. And then over a period of time, she began to have empathy for them. And then over a period of time, she began to 
like them and then ultimately love them and join their crusade. They were like a, a paramilitary um, terrorist organization robbing banks. And there's this famous picture of Patty Hearst with the machine gun robbing a bank. Here's the richest heiress, heiress in the world or richest heiress in the country um, with the machine gun robbing a bank. And so when they studied what had happened to her, they came to the conclusion that she fell in love with her captors. And it's like a psychological, it's like a mind fuck where you literally, the people who you should be running from and terrified of, you end up loving and wanting to support and wanting to protect them. And I think women are probably more susceptible to Stockholm syndrome than men. Why is that? Because women by nature are, are nurturing and mothering and loving. And, you know, my mom, my mom's whole thing, because I would ask her over the years, like, what the fuck were you thinking? Like, I literally say that, like, what the fuck were you thinking? This guy was psychotic. And she would always give me the same answer. I thought I could change him. I wanted to help him. I thought I could change him. You know, every beating, she just took it. I thought I could change him. So it, it's heartbreaking. So, you know, dad that doesn't love you, mom that doesn't love you, um, growing up in an, an, a town where everyone essentially looks like everybody on the Brady Bunch for anybody who's old enough to know what that means. But like, that's how all my neighbors looked. They all, they all looked like they belonged on some, you know, Brady Bunch or Partridge family. Um, they were all white. They were all like, you know, I don't know, good Midwest, good Midwestern people. And then there was me with the parents that, you know, that spoke the different languages and the different religions and the violence and the cops showing up at the house. And so I didn't fit in. I, I felt, you know, completely isolated and alone. I had the, the mental illness going on, which I didn't know I was suffering from panic anxiety disorder. Um, I didn't know what panic attacks were until I was 19 years old. 19 years old. I suffered from 12 to 19, the most horrific, debilitating, I mean, sometimes for fucking hours and hours and hours, I became agoraphobic. I couldn't get off the fucking sofa, let alone leave the house because I thought for sure I was going crazy and I thought they were going to come show up and take me away. The only way that I could make them stop was I would bite my hand as hard as I could. And somehow that pain would would slow down or or get rid of the panic attacks. So alcohol helped a lot and taking pills helped a lot. And in the beginning, weed helped a lot until of course I had a psychotic break when I was about 13, 14 years old and went nuts for a good 72 hours. And then anytime after that, when I would smoke weed, it would re-trigger that that horrible event. So drugs and alcohol at an early age being a coping mechanism. Um, the sex and the shoplifting and the and the the acting out and the vandalism and the false bravado and like f getting into fights all the time and all that stuff. Drugs and alcohol just worked better. And then as I got older and much more insecure and much more vain, I realized how fucking horrible I looked when I drank. I would get bloodshot eyes and puffy and swollen and <laughs> the hangovers. I hated it. Yeah, same. But man, when I started getting into the club drugs in my 20s and being able to like play chemist, you know, and go to sleep with the Xanax and wake up with a, you know, a little bump of something and go out to the club and pop some ecstasy and then have some ketamine and have some GHB, like, I mean, it was fucking glorious for years and dealing drugs because I was an industrious little kid that had a job when he was 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, I was able to support that drug habit, uh, habit um, incredibly well. And then as the drugs got harder and the addiction grew more and more intense and it went from, well, I only party on the weekends. Well, the weekend started on Wednesday night and they ended, you know, sometime around Sunday night. And then one day, like with most addiction, so insidious in nature, I woke up and I was fucked. I was strung out on heroin and crack and anything else I could get my hands on, but mostly heroin and cocaine. Um, 
And I started running out of money. So shooting it was not like people were like, how could you shoot? You know, I'm scared of needles. And like, do you honestly think you're unique by saying something like that? <laughs> yeah. You're scared of me. Really? You're scared of needles? <laughs> we're all fucking scared of needles. Yeah. Yeah. It used to take three nurses to hold me down to draw my blood when I was a kid because I was so fucking terrified of needles. But if you can go from spending $500 a day, which in the end, when I was still smoking it, $500 a day worth of heroin and crack wow. to $20 a day when you shoot it and you're getting way more fucking high, it's just sort of... That's the route I took. Did you ever have to inject it in gnarly places? Like I've heard people injecting it into their eye or shit like that. Never my eye, uh, neck, uh, dick for sure. But that was intentional and sort of, I thought I was being cool and it was an interesting sensation. Um, in between the toes, feet. Uh, I'm trying to think of the weirdest place. I think I think my dick, I think shooting at the, ba at the, at the base of my dick into that vein. Okay. And um, what was that? So how did that differ from? It's just a major rush. I mean, anytime you're taking a needle and you're forcing it into a part of your body, there's that rush, right? Yes. Then there's that rush of knowing that your, your blood is about to be flooded with massive, massive amounts of dopamine and serotonin, right? I mean, you don't know those names when you're a fucking junkie, but you know something good. You can go from feeling like the worst piece of shit on the planet to feeling like you could go play for the NBA. You know, you, you have so much serotonin and dopamine and other chemicals going on in your brain. So you have the rush of that coming, which usually makes you want to poo, right? Yeah. Then you have the rush of knowing you're taking your life into your own hands by sticking a needle in your arm. Okay. Or dick or neck. And then you have the actual rush of that shit hitting your bloodstream. So when you're shooting heroin, you don't, you, I mean, you fucking nod out and it's gnarly. When you're shooting Coke, after about 10 seconds, you can taste it dripping from your gums. Just like if you do like the banana bags now with the B12 yep. and you, you can taste that, yeah. you can taste cocaine or you, what you're tasting is the solvent that they washed it with. So, um, yeah, fuck. I I I went from being a highly dysfunctional, angry, somewhat violent, broken, sad high school dropout, convicted felon loser to all of a sudden having this control or seemed like control over how I felt. I could take these heavy drugs and I could immediately feel different. And I remember very specifically thinking I'm going to feel like this for the rest of my life. I mean, fuck, this is incredible. Uh-huh. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. What's the gateway? What would, For you, what was the gateway into heroin? Because that always seems like a, a, a leap for people. I know people have played in the Coke, ketamine, ecstasy in that space. And then to, to, to come over to heroin, it's, doesn't it seem like there's... I think it's timing. I think... I think that, you know, there's certain periods of time when you would never try heroin. I, I think in the late seventies up until I'd say the late eighties, nobody wanted to do heroin. Heroin was disgusting. Heroin was like a dirty, gross drug. Um, just like crack at first was considered like very lowbrow, disgusting. That's like a ghetto drug. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a long period of time where meth was as as gross as it got, you would never do meth because it was just dirty bathtub drugs. And then all of a sudden meth's really popular and all the kids are doing it. Right. And then all of a sudden, like there's this resurgence of heroin because somebody like Kurt Cobain and, and Courtney Love, or, you know, I think, I think it drugs come and go in their popularity, um, as well as their availability. And it, for me, it was just a perfect storm of like, I had done fucking massive, massive, massive amounts of MDMA as well as, you know, a million different other things. But I think it really caused a lot of damage and, and fucked myself up. And my equilibrium was really off. My circadian rhythm was really off. Um, there's all kinds of theories around, you know, if you do MDMA or I guess they call it Molly now long enough, you become, you know, severely depressed. And I was already fucking depressed to begin with. So, um, 
we joked about heroin. We had an ongoing joke, me and Todd and David and a couple other guys. We would like, I think just for shock value when we were at parties, we'd be like, who's got the H man, you know, just being stupid. Um, obviously all of those idiots that I worshiped as a child, um, that was their go-to drug, but I could never fathom like doing it actually. And then it was like the mid nineties. I was at a party and we're joking around or we're higher than a fucking kite on ecstasy and GHB and ketamine. And me and my buddy Todd started shooting our mouth off. Who's got the H man, blah, blah, blah. And some guy walks up and he's like, I do. And you know, me and all my little friends, I was sort of like the leader of our little king of the dipshits. Yeah, exactly. Um, they all kind of go quiet, like, <laughs> you know? Okay. Mr. Khalil, like what's, what's going to happen here? And I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, well, can we do a trade? I was like, sure. So I gave him some ecstasy. I'm like, all right, he goes, well, come on, let's go. I'm like, where? In the bathroom. We walk in the bathroom and there's like 10 or 15 of my, you know, cohorts sitting on the floor, high as a kite, watching like what the fuck's about to happen. And the guy grabs a beer can and he starts like taking it back and forth. You know how you tear a beer can in yep. half? Yeah. And he's doing that and he goes, grab a pen and, uh, and a knife. I'm like, a pen and a knife? I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And he whips around, he looks at me with these like fucking devil eyes and he goes, look, dude, this isn't fucking Pulp Fiction. This is the real deal. Do you want some or not? And all my friends started laughing. Uh, I was like, yeah, of course. And he's like, well, get a fucking pen and get a knife. And I ran, I grabbed a pen and he sawed it in half and made like a straw and flipped the can upside down and he put the heroin inside of it with some water and then he cooked it from underneath and then he's like here you first what the fuck was i gonna do mr egomaniac mr shit talker mr look how fucking cool i am i had no intention of actually doing it i did it i had to do it i didn't want to lose face i didn't want to look silly in front of my friends in quotation marks <laughs> and so I, I i did it and it was horrible it fucking burned so bad um and then just like literally just like slid down the wall. And all of a sudden that warmth and that comfort and that rush of, um, of dopamine hit my bloodstream. And all of a sudden I was no longer this awkwardly shaped five foot seven, massively insecure, suicidal, depressed, anxious young man, all of a sudden, I was good. I felt no pain. I felt no discomfort. And it was just, it was lovely. And the nausea didn't bother me in the slightest. In fact, nothing bothered me. I mean, my only thought was, fuck, you got to get this guy's number. You got to get more of this stuff. And that was the gateway. It was me and my big mouth being a fucking insecure idiot. And the massive potency and power of something that, look, opiates are great if we got to do surgery on somebody. Opiates are amazing if we snap a limb in half. You know, opiates are, are definitely a plant that is necessary for, for certain things, amputation uh, or whatever. Um, Opiates should not, like most drugs, should not be recreationally used. And if they are, there's fucking hell to pay. You know, it's like the guy who's doing coke who comes to you and says like, hey man, I, I've been doing a lot of coke, but I, I don't know. I think I, like, I think I'm cool, um, but I just want to know like, how do I know if I have a problem? To which my answer is, you're doing cocaine. You have a problem. <laughs> So my problems began, my problems began and, and with my voracious appetite and my anxiety and all of my, how I was sort of, it was like a perfect storm. I was, I was, I was kind of 
I don't want to say made for that drug, but I mean, that drug to me was the end all be all. And you would have eventually ended up doing it, even if it weren't for that moment, right? It's for sure. It was, it was, it was inevitable. I mean, I, I, you know, when someone has an addictive personality like mine and you're doing drugs, you're going to keep doing drugs and you're going to keep doing drugs and you're going to keep doing drugs. And then you're going to keep seeking out stronger and better drugs. Um, I was a drug addict. Yeah. I would eventually found it no matter what. And when something pinged for me, I was just curious when you, you were talking about the first time you, you smoked it and you were describing it, how are you like, what's it feel like to go back into the, cause, cause your, your tone changes a little bit. Like you actually go back almost into the experience to some degree. So what is well, like, I'd love to go deeper there. Mm-hmm. And is there, as you, as you describe it, right. There's all the, 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 the kind of majesty of it. Let's for lack of a better term. Yeah. Is there any concern, any fear that, Oh, that's right around. That's available at any point. Like, no. Okay. No, definitely not. No. Um, and that's something that, that, that's something that's broken with, with modern, uh, rehab or, or recovery. Um, if I would have stopped doing drugs and just gone to meetings every day and worked some sort of menial job, look, I have a lot of respect for anybody that can do that because there's like a 95% failure rate in, in, 12 step programs and rehabs. Um, had I not gone in and discovered why I was doing that shit in the first place and made peace with it, I would have gone back to it. But if you, if you go in and you find the why, right? Yeah. It's not the drug. It's the relationship to self. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the pain. It's the unresolved trauma it's the the lack of self worth. It's the lack of having a direction in life, and it and it it breaks my heart. Um, it breaks my heart to talk about it, and I have to try my best not to be like cavalier or sound arrogant because I just yet again got another Facebook message from a woman who I've been coaching for five years to let go and to detach with love. And she was never able to, and she was always going in and rescuing her son and rescuing her son and rescuing her son. And he's dead. He died two nights ago. Um, it's really, it's really hard because as a parent, your worst fucking fear, it's your worst nightmare, right? It's true. So for me to say to a parent, like you have to have tough love. You have to have boundaries. You have to detach with love. It's easy for me to say, it's not my kid. She's a mom. That's a life that she brought forth from her womb. And my heart just breaks for her. But I know through seeing his correspondence with her and everything that she's told me, he had no interest in being sober whatsoever. Life was not worth it to be sober. But what if you can take somebody like that and as triage, yes, you put them in a, a program for you know 90 days and you get them off all the shit. What if you can really get in there and begin to unpack the trauma, unpack the dysfunction, unpack what the origins of their ouchies are, right? Dad didn't love them. Mom didn't love them. Uncle, you know, touched their naughty spot or whatever, whatever the fuck it could be like. Got, I got dropped off a second story. I don't know if second story is the way you would describe it, but the top part of a boat, my dad accidentally dropped me when I was like two years old and they thought for sure I was dead. I mean, for sure they thought I was dead because it was an incredible height. Nothing was wrong. No, nothing broken, some bruising, but nothing was wrong. Who the fuck knows if that traumatic experience at that age, if I locked onto that, Maybe that had something to do with me being so daring and bold and fucking stupid to stick a needle in my arm. Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Um, I, I think you can continue going down the rabbit hole forever because all of us are full of trauma. All of us are full of fear. All of us, I would imagine, at some level, have a a, a, a base of an like an underlying anxiety and fear and terror of death, terror of life, 
you know, of everything, the great mystery that, that we're experiencing right now. Um, I just, I found meaning. I found purpose. I love my life. I love my friends. I love to laugh. I love to make fun of myself. I love inappropriate humor. Um, I love it when my friends use inappropriate humor against me. I know you have to be very careful about that these days because everybody wants to cancel everybody. But I got to tell you, 18 years ago, right now, I was in a halfway house with a guy named Frank. We called him Frank Violence. Mm. Um, he had a scar on his face which like the second month we finally got him to tell the story of where the scar came from. It's a Mexican kid. And we just assume, you know, gangs or whatever. His ex-girlfriend uh, punched him in the face while holding her keys. Cause she was so mad at him. And that's where the scar came from, <laughs> from his girlfriend, not from a gang. <laughs> I don't think Frank's ever been in a fight in his life, but Frank, I was in, in halfway house with Frank and Steve um, and a couple of musicians. Um, well, actually, everybody was a musician because Musicians Assistance Program was paying for us to be there. But just different guys from different walks of life, different religions, different races of people. We brutally attacked one another. We constantly made you know gay jokes and race jokes. And there was a black guy, there was a Mexican guy, Palestinian guy, you know, Jewish guy, whatever. All day, every day. Now, if someone really got hurt, and you can see. You know, you could see if someone really got hurt. We would back off and we would apologize. But for the most part, we use Gallo's humor to bring in some desperately, desperately needed belly laughter, that real laughter where you're practically pissing yourself because something is so profane and so inappropriate that you got, you know, the fuck your mother jokes and the, you know, <laughs> whatever, like you're the, like, well, Ryan, who he's unfortunately gone, but like Ryan's sister came to visit us. And I mean, just the whole fucking room goes silent because she's like 25, drop dead gorgeous model, you know, whatever. Like that poor kid for the next couple of weeks with the shit that we would. And a couple of times he stood up and like, hey, don't fucking, if you ever fucking say anything. And we backed off. And then the next day we went at it again and we got through it with humor. Eventually, I had to learn how to chop wood and carry water and become self-supporting through my own contributions. And eventually, I found out, you know, where the the source and the origin of of this pain, this discomfort, this alienation, all that stuff came from. And over a long period of time, through a lot of deep introspection, not therapy, I never did the therapy route. Mm. Um, a lot of people do. I didn't. It just seems strange to me to go pay somebody so I could talk about myself. I can fucking call Cal. Mm -hmm. you know, or I can go to a coffee shop and strike up a conversation with somebody, but just through a lot of work, um, Byron Katie's work, mm, um, I love her work. Oh my God. That was a big, big shift for me. Um, strangely enough through watching the secret and then discovering think and grow rich as well as as a man thinketh. When I started getting into that stuff, like realizing I was always putting myself down and I was always living in the scarcity mentality and poverty mentality. And I was constantly saying things like if a hot couple would walk by, I would literally say, it sounds so stupid now, but I would literally say like, I'm never going to have that. I'm never going to have that. My friend Carrie used to mock me. He would see a hot couple coming and he would elbow me. We'd go, you're never going to have that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm never going to have that. I can't afford that. That's for people who had good parents. That's for people who got lucky. Oh, you know, that's fucking nepotism or generational wealth or, you know, second generation fame or whatever. Like that was my fucking mantra was that everyone else had it better than me. Um, and woe is me. And as long as I felt that way, at, by the way, at 33, 34 years old, 35 years old, that was going to be my reality. Fucked for life. High school dropout, convicted felon, emaciated teeth falling out of my head, unemployable. You couldn't give me a job that I wouldn't fuck up because I have no filter. And yet, here we are, 18 years later, I employ hundreds of people. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound like a pretentious No, because I want to get to that. Tell, I want to, you know, for people who aren't familiar with Sun Life Organics, can you give a, a little lay of the land and I'll let you open up the feel free right now while, while you do that. 
I also want to, um, you know, as you were you sharing, I, w- I want to get also to, so I want to talk about Sun Life Organics. Sure. I want to talk about, um, is it Riviera Recovery? Yeah. I want to talk about that. And I also want to talk about what your daily practices are or what your practices are where you're doing the work to remind yourself of, you know, because we're always healing, mm-hmm. right? We never, I don't think, at least in my experience, these old triggers still come up for me. And so how do I create space in my life for those to come up and me not to fall for the trigger? Or yeah. if I fall for it, how can I recover sooner? And, um, you know, for me, again, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to talk <laughs> while you enjoy that amazing feel free, which is available at Sun Life Organics. It, it sure is. And it really is wonderful. Um, I really love this stuff. Um, I mean, God, there's a lot there, you know, as you said, I mean, it, 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 we could do 10 podcasts on what, what are the routines and what are the, it really, I think the main thing that shifted for me and it didn't happen out of inspiration. You know, I did definitely listen to a lot of Tony Robbins stuff and I definitely read Think and Grow Rich over and over again, As a Man Thinketh over and over again. But here's what really happened. Here's the the event. My mom got sick. I was eight months sober and my mom got sick and she was a frail little woman. She was in her 60s and she called me up and she told me that she had cancer. And just like with most of my emotions back then, I just, I just pushed it down and I was like, okay, you know, all right, well, I'll call you in a couple of days, you know, whatever. And I got off the phone and the guy I was sitting with was this really rich guy who I was sponsoring. I was eight months sober. He was like two weeks sober. And, um, he said, is everything okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm I'm cool. Everything's cool. And he dropped me off at his place where he was staying. Um, what place where he was staying. He dropped me off at his house that he was remodeling where he was letting me stay in the guest house. And uh, there was no electricity at that time because they were doing a lot of construction. There was running water, but there was no electricity. And um, he left and I fucking lost it. I lost my shit. I, I realized that I was a fucking bum and a loser. And I was 34 years old. And this woman, this, this poor woman who had suffered so badly, who gave me life, um, look, she was a shitty mom. It's okay. Let's set that aside for a moment. She gave me life. She grew me in her womb. She brought me forth into this world. When I was inside of her, she gave me the minerals from her bones. She gave me the minerals from her teeth, from her hair. Her hair falled out. Um, she, she gave me life and she brought me forth. And when I came out, she fed me from her bosom and she protected me and she cleaned me and I went to the bathroom on her and, you know, she's my mom. This woman gave me life. And here I was 34 years later and she was sick and she needed help and I couldn't help her. I couldn't even go visit her, Cal. Couldn't even go visit her. So the realization hit, you know, all that false bravado that I had used as armor my whole life, all that false pride, all that like, you know, I- I'm cool. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I wasn't cool and I wasn't okay. And I fucking shattered. I shattered on the floor. I sobbed my eyes out. I cried as the sun went down. I cried all into the night. My anger at myself came out and I literally was punching myself in my legs as hard as I could because I fucking hated myself so much because I was such a fucking loser and it had nothing to do with my swim coach molesting me. It had nothing to do with my dad giving me beatings or, or you know, beating my mom. I was a fucking loser because I had, I had done that to myself. I had, I had turned my life into shit by my own actions. I couldn't blame anybody else. You can blame people when you're seven. You can blame people when you're 11. You can even blame people when you're 20. When you're 34 years old, if you're a fucking loser, you're a fucking loser because 
It's your fault, not not anybody else's fault, not Trump's fault, not Biden's fault, not the government's fault. You know, it, it was my fault, and I came to I came to that realization that night that I was a fucking loser, and that I was a horrible son. And I was a detriment to society. And as I was crying and screaming and punching myself in the legs and so fucking angry at myself, I made a vow that I was never going to live like that again and that I was going to be rich and I was going to be able to help my mom and I was going to be able to help if I was lucky enough to have a girlfriend someday, help my girlfriend or help my wife or help whoever. I was never going to be a pathetic fucking piece of shit ever again. That was the vow that I made to myself that night, late, late into the night. And I meant it with every cell in my body. And I asked God for help. And I did those stupid little things that they said to do in the secret. And I made my fucking vision board and I got the Tony Robbins tapes and I started doing my mantras and the finger tapping and every day and every way I'm getting stronger and stronger every day and every way I'm getting better and better. Like it's so embarrassing to think about, but it worked. It worked. I had a job walking dogs at that time for Lou Gossett Jr. And uh, every day I would go up, hike up into the mountains with his dogs and I would do my incantations. I would do my visualizations. I would do a walking gratitude list, which back then was like, thank you, God, for my sobriety. Thank you, God, for my health. Thank you, God, for the roof over my head. Like I kept it really super simple and it never failed. It never, ever failed. I never once got up, started moving, did my breathing exercises, did my invocations or mantras or whatever he calls them, something else. Um, whether it was raining or freezing or sweltering hot outside, it never failed. And I created this positive mindset. And then I fucking went and I went to work. I did anything that was put in front of me. I cleaned up people's dog shit. I ran errands for Cindy Landon. Um, I was a Manny for Billy Bob Thornton's kids. No shit. Yep. Harry and Willie, awesome fucking kids. Um, I washed dogs at Sherman's place. I got a job at the Malibu Ranch, which was a rehab owned by this like crazy maniacal, strangely enough, drug addict guy who owned a rehab. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. A lot of stories there. We'll talk about another time. But um, I got a job there. And then eventually I got a job at the Canyon, which was like a fancy real rehab owned by Fred Siegel and another guy named Michael Cartwright. And just as in that moment that my mom got sick and my mom had cancer and I couldn't help her. And by the way, as I started making money, I started sending my mom money. And I did go back and visit her. It took me about a month. And the more money I made, the more nice things I did to, for her. And all that love that I never got from her, I was able to give love to her. And strangely enough, when I gave that love to her, when I spoiled the shit out of her, when I told her that I loved her over and over again, I needed that love from her less and less that I never got. It's like a trick almost. You know, it's like when you're fucking, when, when people are attacking you, let's say hypothetically you got attacked online and people are saying horrible shit about you. You're supposed to pray for them and not just pray for them like sympathetically. No, pray for your enemies to receive everything they've ever wanted. Pray for all their dreams to come true. Pray for massive abundance and prosperity to come to them. Two things happen in my experience. Number one, you're set free. You're set free. They don't get to rent space in your head for free. You, you rid yourself of the situation. And two, and I don't know how and I don't know why, but it's happened every single time in my life when I've gone through really bad shit, my life gets better and better and better. Sales go up, new locations happen. It's bizarre. So um, I, I, I did my little jobs. I made my money. I took care of my mom. The first real nice thing I did for her was send her back to Poland. She hadn't been back there in 39 years. And I, I think that and then buying her a house eventually will always be the coolest things I've ever done in my life. And I plan on doing some really cool shit. I really do. I may at some point go back to singing. I may at some point go back to acting. If nothing else, I'm going to build Sun Life Organics into a billion dollar brand and I'm going to help a lot of people 
and pay a lot of taxes and be a good citizen and get a lot of people healthy in the process. So I'm going to do some really cool stuff. Nothing will ever feel as good as getting her that house or sending her back to Poland. And she's gone now. She died nine months ago. Um, for some reason at this point, and this could change tomorrow, at this point, I'm good with it. My, mom, my mom's body was falling apart. and She wasn't able to care for herself anymore. So to think, and this is just my belief, but to think that she's with God, to think that she's free now, from all of her ailments, from all of her pain, from all of her suffering, to think that she is somehow here with us, looking at me, knowing that my life turned out so fucking amazing. Dude. Beyond my wildest dreams. Dude, she must have, yeah. So to think about nine months ago and then whatever we, each of us believes happens when we leave this this earth. I mean, I, I am one that that has a strong feeling that she is with you yeah. and, and sees all of this. Yeah, I, I and I talked about this recently and I, I haven't shared it because I don't want to seem like a complete kook if I don't already. But um, you know, I believe in God. I believe that this goes on forever. I don't think that there's any birth or there's any death. And everything I've experienced, both in meditation, yoga, chanting, uh, plant medicine, um, everything that I've ever experienced tells me otherwise that, that this is, this is an eternal journey and we're, we're always here and we'll always be here. And that's my theory. And I've had some kind of like sprinklings of evidence around that. Yep. However, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, I was with Kimmy and Timmy. They have a local business here in Austin where they stretch people. Oh, I know them. Yeah. Yeah. They're incredible. Amazing. Yeah. And she's like, uh, like she's tapped in. Yeah. She is an angel in a human being's body and she can heal you just by placing one finger on you. Yeah. Gunter wanted me to go see her and I'm just like, Oh God, I got away from LA to get away from the healers and all the weird shit. I don't want to go. And he's just like, dude, trust me. You got to go. Yeah. So I go begrudgingly. I walk in. Um, she was really pretty. I, I like that. I'm shallow. Let's just get that out of the way. I'm shallow, pretentious, you know, whatever. I don't know if you're pretentious. <sighs> okay. Anyway, move along. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> let's take this off. so, um, no, honestly, I walk in and she's, she's beautiful. She is. She's like really beautiful. I'm like, okay, cool. At least I'll suffer through this with someone that's beautiful. And female. And um, she's like, lay on the table. And I, I get on the table and she goes, okay, I'm going to put, I'm going to put my fingers on either side of your neck. Is that okay? And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, like fucking, are you kidding me? Like all the shit that I've been through, like you think I'm worried about you touching my <laughs> neck? Like what does she think I am? So I'm just laying there. Like I close my eyes. I just want this shit to get over with so I can go home and call Gunter and be like, yeah, it's not my thing close my eyes. She goes, okay. My hands are a little bit cold. I hope that's okay. She's like, Jesus lady, just fucking do what you're going to do, you know? And swear to God, she goes like that. She touches my neck on either side. I lose it. I know like it was zero to a hundred in a half a second. I am now sobbing sobbing on this woman's table and I'm fucking embarrassed and I'm trying to stop it. <laughs> and there was no stopping it. She just sat there with her fingers on either side of my neck and I'm like, <gasps> and I'm just going and she's like, it's okay. There's just a little trauma coming out or whatever. And I'm like, I'm literally going, did she fucking dose me? Like, did she put some shit on my neck or whatever? Like I couldn't stop crying. And the rest of it was sort of normal. I mean, not normal, but you know, she stretched me after that and whatever. And then when I went to get up, it was just like, I was in a different world and like years of trauma had left my body and mm. I was super dizzy. That was the first time. Second time was similar, but different. Third time, I'm still doubting Thomas. I'm still like, oh God, healer, whatever. She's going to do her weird thing. And I go in and, and she's like, okay, go ahead and get on the table. And I get on the table and then 
she's like doing her kinesiology tapping. I don't know what she's doing because I always have it's my just eyes the closed. Thing with the fingers, where it's well, like, I keep I keep my eyes closed because yeah, yeah. I don't want to see that shit. It's I don't like want two two L A for me. So she's doing her thing, and I'm laying there, and she goes, "Oh, someone's here to to see you," and I'm you know my eyes are always closed, and I'm like, "Was she gonna introduce me to her husband?" Like literally, I'm lay, I'm laying there. I'm like, oh, okay. She goes, yeah, someone's here to see you. Someone's here to visit with you. I'm like, okay. And I start feeling this intense, warm, loving feeling. And as I'm starting to think, mom, she beats me to the punchline and says, it's your mother. She wants to give you something. And the feelings are getting more and more intense and more and more intense. And all of a sudden she goes, yes, she wants to give you something. And my mom, almost as if I had opened my eyes and you're my mom, I didn't open my eyes, but here's my mom. And my mom goes like this. She wanted to give me a hug. My mom wasn't a hugger. My mom didn't hug me, but she goes, she wants to give you something. So my mom starts hugging me. And I'm laying on this table going, what the fuck is going on here? That was the little voice. But the big voice is like, oh my God, mom, you're here. You're here. You're okay. And Kimmy is out loud going, yeah, she's okay. She just wants you to know that she's with God now and everything's okay. And then I go to panic and I try to like grab on because I I don't want it to end. It's my mom. I love her. She's Mm. gone. I want her to be here and see my new fancy house and, you know, see my new garden and whatever. And as I try to grab on, it goes away. And it's not for us to understand what that's about. It's not for us to be able to grab on and hold it and make it a physical thing. It wasn't a physical thing. And that, that's, that's, I think, a really important piece of this, at least for me, is that when we, if we allow, then you have this experience. But once we try to hold on to it, keep it, bring it in. Control it. Control it. Yeah, it disappeared. Yeah, it disappeared. That's such a beautiful share. Thank you. And she hasn't come back, and I don't want to ask. And I just kind of, I've had these moments here and there where, you know, my mom's favorite bird was the red cardinal. My mom was oh, huge. they're all over my yard. Yeah, I've Maybe seen them. That's him. why you like being here. Yeah. I've seen them, yeah. Um, and my mom's thing, like one of her main things, like as we would want to listen to vinyl or we would want to, I don't know, do our little workouts or whatever, like my mom's thing was feeding the birds. Like my mom was obsessed with feeding the birds. And so now in my beautiful new home, I have my mom's picture of when she got her communion, when she finally got out of the slave labor camp in Siberia, she went off to Sweden or Switzerland. I don't know which one, um, because she had TB. So they put her in a sanitarium and she finally made it back to Poland and they gave her first communion and she got her first pair of shoes. And I have that picture and I put it in my family room up high And then she had this picture of Jesus that she always loved. My mom's a Jew, but she loved Jesus and was raised Catholic by these two sisters that took her in. Um, And then I have the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus in one of those Russian metal things. There's a name for them. But so I got that, I got Jesus and I got my mom up above. And then directly in front is this big giant bird feeder that I just keep filled with bird seed. And all day long, all these birds come and they, and and I just, I don't know, like the cats are there. I'm there every night after work. I go and I get on this big white fluffy cloud sofa with my girlfriend. I just feel like my mom's there. And after that experience with Kimmy, I don't know if I could call it empirical evidence. Well, I'm going to call it empirical evidence. I know that my mom's there and, um, and I know she's proud and I know that she's with God and she's okay. And I think we're all okay and we're all with God and we're all going to be okay. And I feel like we are just authoring this as we go along. I feel like all of us are just creating this amazing experience and and we are the authors. And so back to the original thing, because you were asking about routines and whatever, until I could get out of victimhood, 
Un- uh. Until I could get out of victimhood and get out of the chains and the binds of the scarcity mentality, which by the way, my mom taught me, as did my dad, mm-hmm. um, until I could break scarcity mentality and victimhood and take 100% responsibility for everything going on in my life, good and bad, that was when I was able to, at 34 years old, take my first step towards manhood and take my first step towards becoming the man that God intended me to be. Mm, it's beautiful. I think, it, you know, and really just talking about getting your power back, that victim mentality, which is it's easy to fall into it. There's no accountability. Someone else has done this to me. And we just get in this mindset of anything anyone does is to me. And I am just basically a puppet. Yeah. And once we start to own everything that's ever happened in our life, that we had a part in it. And again, I'm not saying that if you had something horrible that you brought it on or I'm not not going there, but there's gray areas. Yeah. But there's gray areas. Did I, did I attract that abuse from the swim coach? I I would imagine on some level I did. And to be fucking super clear, we're not condoning that fuck no okay i just want to be clear that that, i don't want people to get that one wrong i'm not no i i'm that's the one so my half brother i've made peace with that he was eight years older than me he was put into an orphanage by my dad because my dad didn't want him because it wasn't his own kid so he made my mom give him up he went to this horrible fucking place called saint anthony's villa that was eventually shut down because some sick fucking sadistic shit was going on in there when he finally when my mom begged my dad to bring him back four or five years later, whenever it was, he was doing that weird sadistic shit to me. And again, not justifying him, you know, traumatizing me and abusing me, sexually abusing me, not, not, you know, but it's easier for me to make peace because I know why he was doing it versus this older man, you know, this man who was almost 40 years old, like there's no, it's never, it's never justified. It's never okay. It's never, there's, if you, if you're, I, and I've said this before and, I, and I'll say it again, and probably at the risk of being canceled in some way, but you know, if you're in Europe and you're in Ibiza and you're a man in your twenties, thirties, whatever you are, and you know, you're at a nightclub and there's this woman dancing with you and you end up hooking up with this woman, like And then it turns out, you know, a week later, you find out the girl was 17 or whatever. I understand, you know, that's a woman. It's shaped like a woman. You weren't asking for IDs. Mistakes like that happen. I'm not condoning it at all. Um, First of all, I don't think if you're a grown man, you should be at a club in Ibiza doing drugs and hooking up with a strange young girl in the first place. But that I can can wrap my head around, right? When I see the, um, the teachers who are like high school teachers and they end up having these affairs, you know, with their 16, 17 year old students. It's usually a hot woman teacher, which just seems to be easily more easily accepted. Yeah. But but again, I understand that. And it's, we're animals and it's, it's human nature and it's sexuality and we're mammals and whatever that, and again, not justifying in any way, shape, or form, but that I understand. And there, there is sort of like, you can go, oh yeah, fucking stupid, horrible, definitely shouldn't have done it, but it happened. But when it comes to an adult and a child, I, I, will, I will fucking put a gun in someone's mouth. You don't touch a child. You just don't touch a child. So for that man to be touching a little 10-year-old boy at 38 years old, it just, to this day, it's very, very challenging for me to find a whole lot of forgiveness. I feel sorry for him. I can't imagine walking around with that shit. But um, yeah, fuck. It, 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 is, it is what it is. Yeah. And I can't change it. I can only learn from it. And I can make peace with it. Um, Back to the original question, did I have anything to do with attracting that kind of attention into my life? Probably. I was taught as a, as a small child that the way you got attention from people was allowing them to violate you. So mm. maybe in a way I did in, invite that in. 
Um, there's a lot of guilt around that. And it's one of the main reasons why people typically will never talk about that, especially men, because there is a, there is a component of, well, did it feel good? You never want to ask yourself that question. No, you don't. Right? Did you invite that in? You never want to ask yourself that question. So there's a lot of layers there and there's, and there's, there's a ton of shit to unpack. And I would suggest with a therapist, but in, in general, once you get into your, I'd say mid twenties, mid to late twenties, it's time to grow the fuck up. It's time to take responsibility for your life. You can't, can't just go back to that same old script and go, well, the reason my life sucks is because, you know, you got to just go, okay, this is my lot in life and I'm going to make the yeah, best out of it. Yeah, you got to put your big boy pants on. Yeah. And, and yeah, again, take ownership of your life, of your reality. And uh, by the way, I just, uh, I believe, is it, is it uh, TK stretching? It is. is. That, okay. Yeah. For those of you who are curious about who both uh, Khalil and I have worked with, with Kimmy, it's TK stretching here in Austin. So. And do you want to know how adorable they are? Do you know what TK stands for? Timmy, Timmy and Kim. Kimmy. Timmy and Kimmy. Timmy and Kimmy. They are the cutest. He's amazing. I haven't met Timmy. He's amazing. I, I now would let him work on me, but in general, I don't want a dude touching me for obvious reasons. Yeah, so let's go into that a little bit. Sure. I'm so, an open book, brother. Yeah, I figured you were. Literally would. and figured. So we had a conversation. We've had we've actually got to spend a lot of a lot of time together. Yeah. Um, you've hosted me at Sun Life Organics multiple times and we've we've gone deep and we talked about the first time we met. And the circumstances were there was a mutual friend of ours, David Nurse, who was coming into Austin. He was looking for a place to host his friends and some people that I knew. I knew some of his friends. And so I offered to have, have it over here at the house on a Saturday. And just a, a little side note here. <laughs> the week prior, I was in L.A., with one of my dearest friends in the entire world, Matt Jarvis, someone I've known since 95 when I moved out to Chicago. He wow. like took me under his wing, like a real just has shown up in my life in so many different ways. And our relationship continues to evolve. And especially as we're hitting, you know, kind of our late 40s, mm -hmm. you know, he just turned 50. Like we're, it, it's been really special to grow along with him. But, but anyway, I'm out there and we're spending some time together. And he's like, you know, my buddy Mitch is, um, he's friends with uh, Khalil who owns Sun Life Organics. And I didn't know what Sun Life Organics was, right? So I don't really spend any time out in California, but he's like, he just moved to Austin. His book is amazing. He's fascinating. Mitch loves him. I got, I got it. Would you, can I make an introduction for you to Khalil? I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. Like anybody who you think I should meet, like yeah. I'm down. Literally, one week after that conversation, you're here in this very room mm -hmm. and we meet for the first time. And not because Matt made the connection through Mitch, but because you came here through David. Right. And I just love for me, it was like, of course you're going to show up in my freaking, in the unlearned layer here. With a smoothie from Sun Life Organics. Yes. Yeah. And so- that was just the aside, but the real thing I want to want to get into is you talked about your intentions coming over that day. You said, mm -hmm. you know what? Love some of these guys. Great. I'm going to bring a bunch of Sun Life Organic stuff. And you brought so much and showered us with that. You hung out and you're like, you told me the, the whole, the plan was to do that. And then I'm not going to go work out and be Fuck no. hugging a bunch of dudes and sweaty and like, no. That's not my jam. And so as we, 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 we spent probably a good hour and a half in here before we made our way out there, you're like fucking perfect. I got the hang long yeah. enough. Now I can go. And then started to make some excuses, fucking shoulder, back, my back, my yeah. knee. Yeah. And I think I just kept saying, well, great. We'll just modify. You can do this. Like this is not, you know, some dick measuring oh. contest. We're just going to get out there and work together. We're going to get in pairs. So you're going to have a fucking teammate, which you had to trigger you too. What a nightmare. And so we had, I, think, I was sitting right here. Yeah. And the, and right the, in that very seat and the cooler, the Yeti yeah. was sitting right there. 
and you had stayed over there most of the time. I was make, making volcano bags and spinning and, vinyl. And I'm just like, how in the fuck do I get out of this room? I got to get out of here. There's, you know, and then they started talking about, we're going to go do a workout. And that's when I'm like, okay, I'm for sure getting the fuck out of here. And at the first mention, yeah, I said, oh, I can't, I get this thing, my shoulder. And I'm not making that up. I tore my shoulder in three places a little over a year ago. And I also have two herniated discs. And at that time, which was six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, probably seven weeks ago, um, I was still in pain, which I was always in pain with that stuff. Um, I could do little baby workouts here and there at Equinox, you know, mostly just curls and looking at myself in the mirror. Um, but I couldn't do any type of crazy manly shit that I full knew. body stuff yeah. and hit picking up heavy balls and throwing them and, and climbing ropes. Yeah. And so I, I just wanted to get the fuck out of here. I did my duty. I brought my smoothies. I connected with some people. Hopefully they're going to come support my business. My job is done. I got to go. Two things happened. Number one, your wife walked in and I was so like, I wasn't expecting it. There was so much masculinity around me and I was un, really uncomfortable with that. And this goddess of a woman just abruptly walks in and I'm like, ah. And she literally, you were like, that. Yeah, yeah. And she, and she said, um, Oh, can, you know, can I try one? And I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? I would do anything for you based on looks alone. And after I said it, I'm like, fuck, why did you say that? This is this dude's wife. But I don't, I don't have a filter. That's why I was unemployable. And I meant it. Like she was so strikingly beautiful and had this aura about her that that's what came out of my mouth. Are you kidding me? I would do anything for you based on looks alone. You <laughs> laughed your ass off. You thought that was like the funniest response ever. Not because it, it wasn't true, but just because it was so unfiltered and so from the heart. I'm like, I know you just fucking said what you felt. And yeah. I was like, that's fucking amazing. My heart's virtue is pure, authentic self-expression. And it has gotten me into a fuckload of trouble. And it has forged some incredible lifelong friendships. So I saw that. Then all of a sudden, I'm looking at you and then I'm going, okay, just fucking breathe here. Just, <laughs> just go with this. Just go with this. Just see, you know, see what's going on here. Be open minded. Don't be a little, such a little fucker with your little, you know, myopic, like me, me, me. And, and you just kept saying like, no, we're going to work out. And I'm like, ah, yeah, my shoulder. And you're like, no, we're going to do this. And I'm like, ah, yeah, my back. And you're like, no, you're and you wouldn't let it go. And I'm like, fuck, I'm trying. And not like in a douchey, like peer pressure way. I'm like, that's oh, all good, man. Who fuck? We don't, no one fucking cares. Like, no, you put your arm around me in a beautiful, masculine confidence. Like this is my kingdom and I want you to enjoy it. And I want you to come on this little journey. And at mm. that point, I thought, okay, I'll do a couple push-ups and maybe a couple of pull-ups and I'll let them do some, and I'll do some Instagram stories, which will be fun. You know, I can send it to David and send it to Luke's story. And, um, and then we got over there and I started bitching about my ailments again. And the kid next to me goes, yeah, uh, I'm recovering from a brain tumor. And he's like 20. Yeah. Logan, Logan like, Sneed. Oh God. I'm like, I guess I'm doing a workout, you know? And we started working out and I'm looking at this kid with like visible scars on his head. And, you know, I'm looking at these other dudes and I'm starting to realize like, hey, we all have our challenges. We all, we have all gone through our trials and tribulations. And here we are as a, a, a pack of men, like a group, a tribe tribe of men. And I didn't even know it at the time, like how much of a tribe you guys were, but like, we're a tribe of men and we're going to work out as men and we're going to sweat and we're not going to worry about what we smell like. We're not going to worry about whatever's going on out there in the world. And we start working out. And I do have to say this before I forget, because it's important to mention this. My shoulder and my back, my back's been, you know, fucked for years and my shoulder for about a year and a half. My shoulder and my back have not felt better since before the injuries themselves. Like I'm doing shit two years ago. I said out loud to my girlfriend, I'm like, 
well, I'm never going to be able to squat again. I'm never going to be able to do deadlifts again. I'm never going to be able to do a pull-up again after I tore my shoulder in three different places. Dude, I was at Lifetime this morning and trying to emulate your guys' thing, like with the kettlebells, I'm doing the deadlifts, I'm doing the pull-ups. Now you got me climbing ropes. You've mm -hmm. got me slamming heavy balls down. You got me doing all this incredible stuff. And I think just the movement itself, one, the power of being around that masculine energy, which I fear and I- Understandably so, given your past. And I desperately need, I de dude, I come here and it's like taking this thing in and, and, and plugging the thing in. That's what happens here. It's yeah. the hardest I've ever worked out in my life. And yet I leave with more energy than I've ever had. It makes no sense. I'm 51 years old. I shouldn't work out for an hour straight of the most like crazy workout I've ever. I had never done a box jump ever in my I life. You told me that I was so shocked. Why in the fuck would I do a box jump? Yeah, I don't know. I just assumed everybody had because I'd done them. <laughs> Dude, I'm from Ohio. We bench. You do bench. And that's it. And we do some curls so, you know, we can look good in our t-shirts, but I don't, I don't do, I don't do box jumps. I don't do, I climbed a rope when I was like 16 in a gym to show off in front of some girls, typical me. And I slid down and oh. blistered up my hands so bad yeah. that fuck that. When I went to do the Tough Mudders and the Spartan races, I did everything else. I ran through the electric eel cage or whatever, but I was like, not doing it, not doing it. I know what happens when, when you do that. And yet here we were. And, uh, what's his name again with the brain tumor that the Logan, to, Logan, Logan, Logan and, and Luke and all these guys. And we're all just doing the best we can. And then when it came to the station to do the, the rope thing, I just fucking grabbed it. And I, I climbed all the way up to the top and I slapped the thing and I climbed down and I'm like, fuck. I climbed up again. I slapped the thing and I climbed down and like my body's doing things now at 51 years old that at 25 years old, I don't think I could have ever done. So yeah, I love it. Dude, it's amazing. And in what, in just so for people who have context on Wednesdays, I, I have a, a, an open, you know, I kind of share, well, it's my workout, but I have a group of men that come here that numbers in the forties now. Yeah every yeah. Wednesday and fuck the other day you were doing the wall walk. So for people who don't know, if you can imagine being in a handstand, you get your feet against the wall and you're in a push up position and you actually walk your hands towards the wall as your feet walk up the wall. And then eventually you're in a handstand against the wall and that's called a wall walk. And that's kind of what you do. We'll do a couple reps of that. And the next guy goes, you got up to the top with your feet up against the wall, handstand push-up position, and then you started repping out push-ups. Bro, that's fucking incredible. The with or without a hurt, with like the shoulder, like that's incredible. Like that's just hard. The dude that showed me what to do, that's what he did. So I didn't know any better. I didn't understand that you're just supposed to go up and go back. No, the, you the, do that. You do whatever you can do. Well, that guy went and did three... I don't even know what you call yeah, them, handstand shoulder, push up. handstand push up. And so I went and I did it and it was really hard and I was shaking and I almost fell and smashed my nose, but I did it. And now I can actually do it. Not, not with ease, but now I can do it. Like it's cool. It feels good. I feel stable when I'm doing it and I'm getting better and I'm getting stronger, but more importantly, and I think to what you were initially talking about, I'm developing these friendships with these guys it's not, my, that's not my world. I don't, I don't do that. It hasn't been your world. It hasn't been my world. Yeah. And now like today I was with, and I'm feel like an asshole for not remembering his name, but who is the guy that does the online stuff that you connected me with? Austin Floyd. I was with Austin oh, Floyd. Fucking love that who, guy. I, I, how can you not? Every, yeah. everything about him every, is lovable. Every bit of him. Including He's got a little bit of that Adrian fucking Grenier shit going on too. Yeah. Very handsome Good guy. Fucking vibe. So I'm just going to assume he's gay because any guy that's better looking than me, I've got to assume they're that's gay. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. He's not, but that's fair. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I was with him earlier. I, I couldn't have 
had more fun, more laughs. I felt so good feeding him and nourishing him. And then he starts spitting all this knowledge to me about how I can increase the sales of my CPG products and build this online platform. And my fucking head's about to explode. And then the dude with him, who was equally as sweet and kind and was loving- Was it Ian, his partner, or was it someone else? It was a really good looking chiropractor. Okay. From- Oh, Bo. Yes. From San Diego? Yes. He is really so, good looking. He's a yeah. great dude. Yeah. So Bo's across from me and Bo's loving all the stuff that I'm giving them. And then all of a sudden, Bo gets up and he goes, um, he was asking me about my mobility in my neck because it's very limited from mm. a, a bunch of different shit. Um, I was in three really bad. I totaled three cars in 10 months when I was high on junk and I refused medical attention, which began my difficulty with the mobility in my neck. But by the way, this is all in the book, people. This fucking book, if you don't get it, you're an asshole. <laughs> you don't have to get it. Um, by the into, book. Come into Sun Life. And if you see me, I'm so desperate and insecure and such a people pleaser that I will give you one free. It's true. So, he gave me one. So, uh, but even worse, so my, my mobility in my neck was limited after the three car accidents, head on car accidents, unfortunately. But in 2008, I cut my foot really bad. I was trying to break a branch and it slipped and there was a knot on it. It took me right to the bone on the ankle, in between the heel and the ankle. It took it, took it right to the bone. Everything was exposed. You could see veins. You could see everything. Rushed down to the ER and, uh, you know, the wood splinters, all kinds of shit in there. We go in and the doctor at the time, this real prick says, um, okay, well, we're going to have to give you a tetanus shot. And I'm like, no, 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 I, no, no, I don't do that shit. I don't do, I'm not, I don't like any of that shit. And he's like, no, we have to give you a tetanus shot. And I'm like, it's, it was wood. I'm not doing a tetanus shot. It was wood. And he goes, if you don't do this tetanus shot, I'm going to kick you out of here. I'm not going to clean or dress this wound. What was I going to do? I'm laying there. I'm in really bad pain. And the dude gives me a tetanus shot. A few days later, and I, I don't remember how many days later, but I started to get this horrible pain right back here on either side of my neck. And the pain got worse and worse each day that went by. And eventually my shoulders, my traps, my neck completely locked up. It was, it was like tense in here, really painful and tense back there. And I lost almost entirely the mobility in my neck. And it's been like that for years. It's gotten a little bit better over time, especially going to see Kimmy and Timmy. But the reason I'm telling you all this is because um, handsome Dr. Bo knows, stands up and he's just like, you've been so amazing and you've been you know, nourishing us and feeding us and you're a great guy, but I, I really like, I can see you got a lot going on there. Would you mind if, and I'm like, I'm, yeah, what, Ed, yeah, whatever, you know, do whatever you're going to do. And he's like, just, I want you to just relax. And then he goes and he like feels in here and he's like, oh God, oh Khalil. He's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so sorry. You are so locked up. This is not good. You need to work on this. Let me help you. I will literally help you for free. I'm going down to San Diego, but I'm moving back soon and I will literally treat you for free. I don't want to be a chiropractor anymore, but I'm really good at it. I'm like, cool, dude, <laughs> like, hey, whatever you want to do. And he goes, just please just relax into my palms. Just let me control it. And he's, he's going like, Have you, has he done this to you? No. Holy shit. The sound that came from the left side of my neck, the cracking I've done a lot of cracking in my life. I've never, ever, ever heard a sound like that before and the release. And then he goes and he does it on the other side and the immediate lengthening of the vertebrae in the back of my neck, that locking. And he's just like, you know, you're going to be a little bit sore from this, but just like, you know, keep the mobility going. And when I get back, we're going to work on this and we're going to fix this. And I was just like, my God. So this man's, you know, healing me. Uh, the other young man is Austin. talking about 
you know, building my business and helping me find the website designer and this and that. And I, and I could go on and on and on from all these different amazing people who I've met here, which is such contrary action for me because had it not been your house, your hot wife, your cool haircut and cool office and just cool vibe about you, if this were any other place and there's a bunch of dudes about to swing some kettlebells around, you'd have to put a fucking gun to my head to get me to do that stuff. First of all, because I don't want to be injured. Second of all, because I don't want to be around a bunch of fucking sweaty dudes. And now it's the best part of my week. It's the best part of my week. Men need to be around men. Men need to be around men. Real, authentic, raw dudes, men. I love it, man. I love all of it. it it's, it's what I've noticed. We started this back in November with six of us, I think six or seven of us. We started working out here on Wednesdays. And as you know now, it's into the 40s. And everyone comes... Uh, probably a couple people know that you own Sun Life Organics. Mm -hmm. You've been coming for now a couple months. Yeah. People don't know what anybody does. It's not important. Yeah. Now, if there's an, you know, I'm hearing you talk about you're doing this with the CPG. It's mm -hmm. like, you need to talk to my buddy Austin. That's when people start to know because right. there's a connection to be made. But that in, out there in the bunker is not about making networking. No, it's about not at all being in a space. It's, Healing can come from so many different places. And for you, with your experience with men growing up, who'd have thought that it would have been in a quote unquote workout space that this healing would continue? Right. No, I mean, I left here on Thursday because we changed the day. Right. Yeah. I left here on Thursday. And again, I need to stop being so focused on myself and try to remember people's names. But there was a guy, his, his girlfriend is Hallie Rose. Dr. Judd. Dude, Dr. Judd Fucking walks up him. to me after the workout, looks at me and says, you're hanging on to a lot of shit and I'm going to gift you a session. He doesn't need the work. He's got money. He's busy enough. He wasn't looking to network. He saw that I was sort of in harm's way in terms of my physicality, like I was hanging on to stuff and I wasn't moving the way that I should be moving if I were fluid and open like he is. I mean, that dude's like, you see him doing those like- He looks a little different than you and me. Yeah. I'm pretty locked. I'm not quite locked up like you, but I have severe mobility he issues. Is, he is fluid and looks amazing and feels amazing. And he came up to me and he was like, take my number. I'm going to gift you a session. You need some help. If I can't help you, I'm going to refer you to somebody that can. So it's like of all, like starting out where I was on the sofa, arms crossed, get me the fuck out of here. I don't want to be around a bunch of dudes to a couple months later, all these incredible things are happening in my life. And take all of that away, even if he wasn't going to do that. And even if, you know, Dr. Bo didn't fix my neck today, set all that aside, I feel more manhood inside of me. I feel more masculine, and I mean that not in the typical way. I feel more masculine than I've felt in a long time, and I've been noticing silly little things like just not worrying about if I got a shower, but how about just go and jump in the garden and start doing some work? And it's okay to not be you know, smelling like, um, I don't know, some French gigolo or something. Like I'm always <laughs> like <laughs> dousing myself with all these oils and unguents and creams and, you know, whatever. And I'm always so paranoid about the way that I smell. And I've noticed some of that's going away. I've noticed some of that's going away. As a matter of fact, yeah. not often, but as a matter of fact, a couple times I even went to work without showering. And I'm not suggesting to anybody to stop bathing and stop being clean. But if you are so rigid and paranoid about how you smell and about how you look, and you think that other people are only going to like you if you look and you smell or behave a certain way, then 
maybe I would encourage to loosen up on that a little bit. And so that's the byproduct. Another big shift was when you said, come work out with us Wednesday. I was like, yeah, I'm going to get all the coolers. I'm gonna, And you said, no. I'm like, what do you mean? I thought you were going to say, no, I have my own shit or we're going to make our own smoothies. Mm. You said, no, you don't need to bring anything other than your amazing energy. Mm. And I walked away and the whole way home, that just kept playing in my head because there is that part of me that's like, well, people only like me because I give them free smoothies and free acai bowls. And, yeah. you know, people only like me because I'm, oh, I always pay for dinner. I always pay for dinner. And I start to question that sometimes. Like, people only like me because I pay for dinner. People only like me because I give them free stuff. People only like me because they saw me with Anthony Kiedis or they saw me with Gerard Butler and they think that I'm going to give them a script or I'm going to give Rick Rubin their demo or whatever. Like so much of that was going on in LA and I started to buy into it and I started to believe it. And then it goes back to the initial, the original sense of worthlessness and feeling like a piece of shit. Like that stuff doesn't go away. You don't, you don't get a hundred grand or a million dollars in the bank and all of a sudden you're fixed and you're perfect. Like you said earlier, this is an ongoing evolution of our soul, of our physical being, of our place in society within our own relationships. Like my relationship now with my girlfriend versus what it was like five years ago, it's fucking mind blowing. It's mind blowing. I was dropping her off at the green belt this morning because it's a bit of a distance from our house. Mm -hmm. And she had no problem running back once she was warmed up, but she wanted to go run this green belt. I'm like, isn't that the place that you told me where there's the scorpions and the tarantulas and the snakes and whatever? And she's like, yeah, I just want to explore. And she got out of the car and she walked away. And there wasn't that weird, like, okay, I love you. I love you too. Like, like there wasn't any need for that. There was this comfortable knowing and understanding of one another and appreciation of one another. And I'm going now in my fancy air conditioned Range Rover to my fancy gym with the fancy air conditioning to go get on a treadmill, right? Because uh, I'm a baby and I don't want to be in the humidity and I don't want to be in the dirt and I don't want to be around. And I'm thinking about her and I'm on the treadmill and I'm just picturing her going back, running through those trails. And she already got poison oak. She doesn't care. She's just going to keep going. And I just thought like, I am so in awe of her. I have so much respect for her. I'm a little bit even envious of her adventurous spirit and her ability to get up every day and just charge and just go for it. And so my relationship's evolving, my life is evolving, my business is, is evolving, and all of this is just heaven sent. All of this, everything, the connections that are coming mm -hmm. together, Luke's story, being here, Tarot from Four Sigmatic, um, the skinny confidential people who you met Michael, but I want you to meet Lauren because yeah. Lauren is Lauren is the goddess. Yeah. And Lauren is, she's just such a powerful being. And I want you to be on their show if I could maybe somehow make yeah. that happen. Mm -hmm. be an but honor. but all all these people coming together and and then even like the shit with Anya, like the stuff that happened to Anya with Belcampo and how people were like viciously attacking her and making up all these lies and saying such stupid shit like you're going to go to jail or you're going to lose everything or you're a fraud. I talk to Anya every day. I call her 10 times a fucking day. because I know who she is and I know what she stands for and I know what an amazing, amazing human being she is and I know what an amazing product she has. The meat industry is one of the most highly regulated industries on the planet because of the power of it's like pharmaceutical lobbyists and then dairy. And then I think meat is like one of the most powerful. And then just in a nutshell, land it for everybody. Like what, what, what happened with, with onion Belcampo? Some guy went on line um, on Instagram and did a, a series of stories saying that everything at Belcampo was fake and that all the meat that they were selling was fake and none of it was really truly pasture raised. And it was corn fed traditional meat and they were taking regular meat and they were selling it to all of their customers as their own grass-fed, grass-finished organic meat. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. But this guy in today's day and age with cancel culture running wild is allowed. You know what happened? Six months ago, seven months ago, 
pandemic fucking crisis crazy, their online sales explode. They start running out of shit. They didn't have their own chickens because they got burned in the fire, right? Ooh, yeah. So one of her managers orders some organic chickens and is putting them on their cob salads and orders some organic bacon and is putting it on their cob salads. Now, they didn't tell anybody. I guess they weren't transparent about it. But the manager was just doing his job. He was, you know, keeping shit going in the middle of a global pandemic and serving the customers to the best of his ability. He didn't go to fucking Ralph's and buy some garbage, <laughs> you know, nasty shit. He bought organic stuff. It was still organic. It just wasn't from... It wasn't from them, number one. And number two, it wasn't pasture raised. So it wasn't free range or whatever. Fuck. But... It was organic. It's such a fine line. Such, I mean, that's splitting hairs. But all over the country, all over the news and, you know, LA Eater Magazine, all these different publications, and they're only going on what they're being told on uh, on social media, that everything at Belcampo is fake and the whole thing is a fraud. And it 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 blows my mind that someone as amazing as her um, who does such amazing work, meaning the regenerative farming and the, and the free range. I've been to the ranch. I've, I've hung out with the animals. I got chased by her chickens when she still had chickens. Not joking. Got a video of it. Um, I took a part, I don't know what you call it, but a, a carcass maybe. That's probably not the right word. But I, along with her and one of her master butchers um, and a group of about 50 people, we took a part one of the animals after it was humanely harvested took it took it apart and every single piece of that meat every single piece of that carcass was used the bones and all that stuff turned into bone broth and a lot of the other parts turned into um pet food collagen and, yeah and all, all, all that stuff bone yeah. yeah so and i know how how highly regulated she is because we talk a lot and she tells me like, oh my God, the FDA showed up again. They want to inspect the slaughterhouse. Oh, they want to ins inspect the place where we humanely take the animals down. And now they want to inspect the soil. So here this woman has built this brand for 10 years. 10 years she's been doing the right thing. And she's a woman. Very difficult to start a business. Very difficult to get a business successful. Almost impossible to do all that with any you know, sustained period of time, but she's been doing this for 10 years and some guy gets into an argument. Well, I can't talk about that part, but some guy, some guy gets fired, but six months earlier, he took some videos of some stuff that was packaged that wasn't theirs that they were serving, which look, they shouldn't have done it. She owned it. She came out and she apologized. But the fact that he was able to twist it into this story that everything they do is fake and you've been, you know, they're a fraud and she should go to jail. It lasted for about 10 days and it went away. But here's one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met going through such a painful experience, being attacked like that, which is happening every day, you know, people being bullied online. And for me to be in this tribe, for me to be in this town, for me to have gone through my own trials and tribulations over the years, to be able to be present for her and to just listen to her and to let her know constantly, I love you, I believe in you, I'm here for you. And to watch like Justin Rizvani do the same and to watch David and to watch Taro and all these other men support this brave woman who's doing such an incredible job and it was, it was, it was just amazing. And that's part of that whole being part of this masculine tribe. That's what we need more of. Men need to be men and surrounded by men. Men need, men need to be honest and forthright. Men need to sweat. Men need to grunt and pick up and throw down heavy shit. And men need to support each other and love each other. And I love the beginning where we all get going, chanting and clapping and whatever. I love the middle part where everyone, strangers are just walking by and whacking you on the back and, you know, keep going, man, or awesome job or whatever. And I love the end when, um, is it Garen? Garen. I love it when Garen brings it home at the end and basically says, like, what we were talking about earlier, like, zero excuses. 
100% responsibility. I'm, I'm misquoting him, obviously, but zero excuses and 100% responsibility because Garen is now a grown man, like you're a grown man and I'm a grown man. We cannot have excuses anymore. D your dad may have been an absolute prick. He might have been unloving. I don't know. I don't know anything about your dad. My dad had his challenges. My mom had her challenges. None of that shit matters anymore. And here's what it comes down to. Oprah got raped by her own uncle, was pregnant at 13, was sexually molested over and over again, grew up and was born black in a time in America where being born black was a real mark against you back then and dealt with weight issues her entire life. She went through way worse shit than I went through. She didn't go smoke crack. She didn't go shoot her mouth off at some party and go, where's the H, man? Who's got the <laughs> H, right? <laughs> Oprah worked her ass off and built her career and went on to affect probably a billion yeah, people. I would say it'd be. Yeah, a billion a people. There. And when I, when I look at that woman, I'm, I'm so inspired and it reassures me. I got no fucking excuses. I got a lot of work to do. I need to, I need to love myself like my life depends on it. Like Ramit's book or whatever his name is. Is it Ramit? Kabal or Kamal Ravikant? I don't know. Whoever, whoever yeah, wrote yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah. I need to love myself like my uh, life. Yeah, Kamal Ravikant. I need to love myself like my life depends on it because it does. I need to exercise and eat as if my life depended on it because it does. I need to exercise as if my life depended on it and work as hard as I can to be the man that God intended me to be. A, a loving man, a kind man, a forgiving man. And it's not all going to be perfect. It's not all going to be as much as I, as, I, as I love telling you the story about how I sent my mom back to Poland and how I bought my mom the house and how I was the great son. Didn't work with my dad. I tried. I definitely tried. We don't get along. My dad doesn't like me. I think deep down inside, my dad wants to love me. And I definitely love my dad. And I definitely wish my dad all the best things in, in, in life. I really do. There's no resentment there. I just refuse to have someone who continually does their best to make me feel small in my life. Well, I'm no fucking psychologist, but you could imagine a scenario where you're a reminder of how he didn't show up in a way that was loving and kind or, or whatever, right? That you could be just a reminder and it's literally nothing to do with you, the person, it's you as the symbol. You couldn't have said it better. And I'll just give you a little bit of insight into the relationship and how I thought I was going to take my money and buy his love and affection and, 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 and approval. Um, and it did work for like a moment, you know, but when, when Sun Life first opened up and there's like 12 of them now, but this is back when there was like four or five of them and there's a line out the door. And I mean, literally out the door and it's, it's time. I'm, I'm with my dad. I flew him out first class. I put him up at a fancy hotel on the beach. It's time. This is it. I timed it perfectly. I got him in on a Friday evening, dinner at some fancy restaurant. I think Nobu. Um, next morning, I pick him up a little bit later than he wanted to because I wanted to make sure that line was there. And we go and we, we park, we get in the parking lot and um, we get out of the car. And I never park in the pavilion side, but I specifically did it because I was hoping that line was out the door. And sure enough, we're walking past Bank of America and I see it and I stop. And he's like, what, what are you doing? And I go, look, dad, here it is. Finally, finally, I'm fucking 47 or 49. No, how old was I at the time? No, I was 45 years old. And the line's out the door. And here's my moment. The sun is shining on me. This is it. I finally get to get that thing that I've always needed from my dad. And I go, look. And he goes, what is that? And I go, that's my business, dad. And he goes, what the fuck? Are, are you giving something away? And I said, no, dad, I'm selling stuff. 
And, uh, <laughs> and that's the line. And he's standing there and he's looking. And I'm like, here it comes. Here it comes. I'm like, God, please. I Thank God it's finally here. And he starts to walk. And without even looking at me, he goes, I should have fucking moved here 30 years ago. I'd be a goddamn millionaire. He just kept walking. And it never came. And I tried a bunch of other different angles, you know. I remember Pierce Brosnan. I told him, like, do not ask someone who's famous for a picture. Whatever you do, never do it. It'll ruin my business. Pierce Brosnan walks in. And Pierce being Pierce, this is just his character. One of the coolest human beings on the planet. Pierce Brosnan and Jeff Bridges. I was I, say that's cool because he, his character is definitely the coolest motherfucker on the planet. He's, he's the he's the best. Him and him and um, I'm being a disgusting LA name dropper. No, but I fucking love Lebowski. My one of my top three movies of all time. Well, you know, I worked for him from the book. I think I talked about that in the book. I hope I talked about that. You did. In the book. Okay, you did. So Pierce being Pierce, he sees me. He looks at a. 80 year old man next to me who's clearly my dad and <laughs> and walks up and does the full fucking James Bond like excuse me are you Khalil's father you know and I'm just like oh fuck there is a god it's like I just want to tell what what an honor it is to meet you and your son is just such a a, a pillar in our community and and we're so grateful for him I'm like oh my god please don't stop talking ever and it was amazing. And I'm like, this is so great. This is so great. My dad's like, can I get a picture with you? <laughs> <laughs> didn't see that coming. Pierce did it and he didn't care, but I fucking told him 50 times, do not ask people for pictures. He ain't listening to you. No. And he's and never going to, and it's all good. There's so, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack yeah. with all this. Yeah. And, uh, you know the answer, you know, it's, it's what, it's what you were alluding to, like you coming with giving the gifts, right? I, yeah. I, I recognize that because that resonates for me. Yeah. You know, very much taking care of people. And then when you do that enough, okay, do they like me for me or do they like me because I bring these things? Yeah. And. I think the the more work I do to separate and to allow someone else to pick up the check and mm -hmm. to allow someone to help me and to allow the guys to, you know, pitch in for the 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 party on Wednesday, which isn't going to cost me that much money, but I'm happy to take care of it. And for guys to say, well, we want to chip in. What what was your words? You, your words were brilliant. You said I received this. Yes. Fuck that floored me. I would jump at an opportunity to treat everybody um, at a party and get a bunch of fancy stuff there, partly because of my mom and partly because I have a good heart and a good soul and I want to share with people, but also a large part of it would be so I could feel good about myself and I could maybe do a little humble bragging and show off a little bit. And you, when they said chip in, I could see you didn't want that because this you want to do this for them. I already had it planned out yeah. that I was going to buy everything, and so and they were like, "No, we want it. You know, we want to chip in. We want to, Everyone's going to put in money. You know, blah blah blah." And you stopped and you checked yourself and you said, "I'll I receive this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll receive this." And I was like, "That's incredible." It's just it's been taking a lot of work to get there, though. I, and I meant it when I said that. I felt it, and it's um. It's it's like all the kind of the same stuff when you're talking about going out in the garden without smelling all perfect mm -hmm. and going into like for me it's it's all the same stuff that 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 I've continued to work through right yeah. I maybe just been working on it a little, little bit longer but it's it's like who am I without all of it. Mm -hmm. Who am I without all the muscles? Who mm -hmm. am I without the fucking cool haircut and, and whatever, whatever else, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if I can get really clear on that and really get in touch with who that person is and then embody that. Because mm. when I embody that, I start to attract people that are attracted to what's deep in my soul, yeah. not what's on the outside, 
you know, and so for me, and I've been rewarded with amazing people like yourself coming into my life. Thank you. Again, Thank think you. about it. You wouldn't, if I had presented a different way, mm -hmm. you'd have left this. You wouldn't have gone on that I workout. Was, yeah, I was desperate to leave. I had to come on a little bit showy, a little douchey, a little whatever, a little hard day. Come on, let's go fucking work out. Let's go. Like, it's just not my energy anymore. Yeah. So like, that's, that's it. Like what other things you're talking about these new skills you're learning here at, at Wednesday workouts. What other new things can you try that will continue to open you up mm. and show you? I mean, look at what happened when you opened up on that Saturday here, this whole fucking new world opened yeah. up. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Bro. And the repercussions, I would imagine a year from now are going to be so monumental. And I can't, I'm just so excited after leaving my little meeting today with Austin. Austin. God, yeah. how can I not remember you're Austin? Just, you're just not good with names. I'm not good it's with clear. names. It's clear. I've, I've, heard this from you a number of times after my meeting with austin today and after brad coming out here last week and and just seeing everything and we're working on all this amazing stuff so you know as you and i have talked about several times like the fact that we don't have our own greens powder is embarrassing like i'm obsessed with greens powders i'm obsessed with superfoods i'm obsessed with quality i'm obsessed with creating the best of the best of the best of the best if you try our matcha even if you hate me even if the sound of my voice makes your skin crawl if you try our matcha, <laughs> you are going to come to the conclusion that it is the greatest matcha on the planet. It's the best matcha there is. I've been to Japan multiple times. I've gone to the different tea fields. I've met the different tea masters, the different farmers. I've gone to the different factories. I found a matcha that is mythical. Mm. It is amazing, right? Mm. You're, you have, yeah, it's great stuff. Um, <laughs> and Lindsay, big thumbs up. And- the fact that we've been working so hard for the last 10 years to build this brand and, and continue to evolve and you know be the best of the best of the best, but not have a product line, it's just, it, it, it's sad. It's sad that that didn't dawn on me five years ago that if you're using all these incredible products and you're sourcing them and you're going to Peru and you're finding the maca, how is our maca not for sale? It is, it is the best fucking maca there is. And let's turn that frown upside down and say, God damn, I'm so glad we're going to do it now. Okay. Like if you had done it five years ago, you wouldn't be as excited about it today. And you're fucking pumped about it. Every time yeah. we talk about it, you're lit up. Think well, about five, that. Five years ago, we were two macas back. So say I, you would have had low grade maca. It wasn't, it wasn't low grade. It was amazing. Lower grade. It was organic. It was from Peru. But this particular maca that I found, there's this amazing dude who lives half the year in, in Peru, found an heirloom variety that grows up at 12,000 feet elevation. And it is like the people that harvest it, they're literally almost as wide as they are tall because their lungs need to hold so much more air because they're up that high wow. and air is scarce. And so these amazing indig indigenous people have protected this coveted heirloom variety of maca and like, it's no bullshit. This shit, I will put it up against any maca out there. It is the best maca. Wow. And we are now in the process of packaging it and we will get it out there for sale. How long until the CPG line comes out? That's consumer packaged goods for those who the, don't know. The matcha is already out and available. Our granola, as of last week, we now have our paleo granola, which we make in, in a kitchen in Van Nuys in a commissary. I should have brought you a bag. That was you thoughtless. I'm a bad thoughtless guy. Thoughtless and considerate. I did bring you, uh, didn't I bring granola bars? Oh, yeah. I love those. I think a banana chocolate. Yes. I think I it's got my two fave. Of them. Yeah. So we have some stuff now, but there's a lot more coming. Um, working on a bottled line of beverages, working on the protein powder, both vegan and um, not vegan. Oh. Yeah. And Call it uh, whey protein. Whey protein, yeah. yeah from New Zealand, grass fed, grass finished, all that stuff. So my passion, my purpose is to help people to feel the same metamorphosis, miraculous metamorphosis that I felt when I was 33, 34 years old, newly sober, shot out, low energy, fatigued, depressed, anxious, looking like a corpse, um, to where I am today, which I mean, this isn't like, I mean, most people that know me would tell you I look younger now than I did 20 years ago. 
lots of amazing stuff happening, working on the third book. It's probably going to be another year until it comes out. But what's the premise? The premise is, okay, so you got, I forgot to die, which is about the sad, broken, you know, obsessed with wanting to kill himself. That title is so fucking good. Thank We've you, all brother. talked about it. Like how they crushed it with that title. Thank you. Thank you. It came out of nowhere. It came out of the ether, like most great things, like yeah. most of my great recipes, like most of my great ideas just kind of matriculate down through the ether and then come into my being. And so can't take credit for it. Fair. Um, but um, so that that's the dark, scary, sad Cinderella story memoir, which is done incredibly well. Thank you, God. It's in a bunch of different languages and it's sold out on Amazon multiple times. So I'm super stoked about that. Remembering to Live, which is my second book, is the response to all the people saying, well, he must have had some family money or I'm sure, you know, he married well or I'm sure like there's 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 people that would make those comments or there's people that would DM me and say, okay, how do you go from living under a bridge to being a millionaire? That doesn't make any sense. So I wrote the second book in response to those questions to show people exactly how okay. like this isn't some weird like get rich quick scheme this is i was living in a halfway house that musicians assistance program was paying for and they were giving me and frank violence 40 dollars a week to live off of that's all the money we got we bought the cheap tobacco, no name, generic tobacco from the gas stations, and we would roll each other cigarettes. We got the giant industrial size thing of coffee from Smart and Final, mm. and we got the giant industrial size Prego and the pasta noodles, and we got along just fine. I mean, when I think about that now, like you, you can't get a coffee for forty bucks, but like I lived off of forty dollars a week back then for months at a time, and. How do you go from there to then where I am now or where I was a few years ago? And it is literally play by play of what I did, how much I worked, how I worked, where I worked, what I did for work, what I did with my money when it came in, how I invested my money, how I got incredibly fucking lucky when gold, silver, and platinum went parabolic, which I was 100% in. I didn't have any stocks. I didn't have anything. Everything was in precious metals. Um, to show people, you don't have to be smart to be rich. You don't have to be smart to be successful, right? I went from being unemployable to having hundreds of employees. And I show people step-by-step step in remembering to live how I got to where I am now. And then also some of the truths that I had to contend with. Book three is about what happens when business takes off and not, not business takes off. R Riviera recovery exploded. We were, we were booked with a waiting list. Sun Life Organics exploded, did incredibly, incredibly well. Um, started opening up multiple locations, sold off a small piece of the company, which I had never done before and I'd never had money before. So all of a sudden, I remember telling Rick Rubin because he was the only person that I could be honest about how much money I all of a sudden had in my bank account because I didn't want to like, I don't know, upset people or provoke jealousy or gossip or whatever. But I said, Rick, I'm really depressed and it doesn't make any sense. I told you how much money I have now. And he said, mm -hmm. you learned what most people will never have the privilege and opportunity to learn. And I'm like, what? And he said, you learn that success doesn't equal happiness. And most people will never get to know that because most people are stuck in the someday I'm gonna, and I should do this, and maybe I'm gonna do that. Just like you used to be. Just like I used to be in that poverty scarcity mentality. Yeah. So what happens if all of a sudden you get a bunch of money and then the money starts to stack on top of itself. And then all these great opportunities come your way, little investments you get to do. You know, I invested in a pizza place. I invested in a bunch of small different things and money's growing and money's growing and money's growing. Started getting into stocks, made quite a bit of money day trading, just being an idiot, not, yeah. not being smart, but just like, okay, I'm at Lululemon. There's a line out the door. There's some lady fighting with another lady, grabbing the entire sales rack saying, this is mine, right? Yep. I went home, 
I bought Lululemon stock. Their yeah. earnings were about to be released. I piled in with almost every penny I had. The stock went up almost 30% <laughs> the morning they released or the day, the day after the mornings were released in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Shit like that. So what happens if now all of a sudden you're financially independent, you got a bunch of money, you got a best-selling book out, you start getting invited on tour to go around the world with some of the biggest bands. You start getting invited to Cannes Films Festival, whatever. You start getting invited to Saint Tropez and Wednesday workouts at the bunker. <laughs> like just the fucking list goes on and on. No, that's the antithesis. So, what happens if you're now flying around the world on these people's private jets and you're staying in their penthouses and everything's free and you're backstage here and you're on this yacht and then you're on a helicopter and you're verified on Instagram, which we talked about earlier. Yeah. And then you wake up one day with however many, three or four watches in your safe and a bunch of money set aside, a bunch of gold set aside and a soul sickness has set in. What happens then? What happens when you realize that all these things that you had always fantasized about, that if you got to that level, if you got to be around those people, mm -hmm. if you got to go to those parties, what happens if you're hurting and you feel sick on the inside? Dark night of the soul. Yeah. And I had it. I love it. I had it. And in the process of coming to the realization and look flying around the world on Dan Bilzerian's jets and, you know, hanging out with his entourage of, you know, 30 girls and whatever. Like, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Dan and the, or, or Rick or any of the people that I got to travel with because they're cool and they got their lifestyles and that's fulfilling for them. But I don't want to be around 30 girls with big giant boobs and whatever in San Tropez or, right. you know, I want to, I want to be with my girlfriend. I want to go on a walk. I want to develop deep, meaningful relationships with other human beings. I want to share with the world through my trials and tribulations, the little tiny bit of wisdom that I have. I want to feed people. I want people to feel the same energy and vitality that I felt when I first started putting super healthy stuff into my body. And, um, the third book is, is essentially about that, about that lifestyle that most people will never get to experience, but I experienced it and I feel like God, the universe would ever put me in those situations so I could really, truly learn because I really like, and this probably speaks volumes about how naive I am or, or downright dumb in certain things. Um, I remember being at an AA meeting, shit, or whatever, 12-step meeting. I'm not supposed to say AA. I remember being at a 12-step meeting. I was like six months sober. I remember it like it was yesterday. And this brand new Targa pulled in. And I hadn't seen a Targa since I was a kid. I thought Targas were done. But Porsche had just brought out a new Targa with the glass roof and super fucking cool. And I was at this meeting, 12-step meeting, at this the Michael Landon Rec Center in Malibu. And I see the, the Porsche pull in and I'm like, man, that's beautiful. And then I see the dude get out and he walks over and he's like standing with us, the AAs, or the, the recovery people, the 12 step people, <laughs> really sorry. Recall. And I like look over at him. I'm like, is that your car? And he goes, yeah. And I go, that's awesome. That's a Targa. And he goes, yeah, they just came out with the Targa. I'm like, that's, that's amazing. He's like, thanks. And I'm like, this is a 12 set meeting. He's like, I know that's why I'm here. I'm like, that's your car. And you're at a 12 step meeting. Dude, that's how naive and childish and feeble minded I can be. I believe my whole life, like, Many people. Like many people. So easy on the feeble-minded. Well, when you get the car and you get the watch and you get the house or you get whatever your version is, that then that's it. You're set. No more yeah. bad days. 
No more bad days. There's no more bad days. Nothing that ever happens again. You'll never feel insecure. You'll never feel tired. You'll never feel sad. Like, I, I really wholeheartedly believe that. And then the fame thing, if you mix that in, because remember, most of those people were either my customers or my friends who were all wildly famous, like some of the most famous people on the planet. And I'm watching what they go through. They can't take two steps out onto a street until they're accosted. And people don't want to meet them. People want a picture with them. Yeah. That's all they want. They want to do that. They don't want to meet they them. They want to fuck it. They just fucking bother them every step. It's They can't live their life. They don't know who's their real friend. Ooh, how about that? Horrible. Yeah. Like in a real way, not like, oh, I pay for dinner. I wonder if people really like me or not. Exactly. These people will never know. You can stop buying dinner and find out. They can't stop being famous. Nope. I can center myself, say my prayers, do a little meditation, a little bit of breath work, and then I can come to the realization that I'm not that bad. I'm yeah. actually- I'm tolerable. Somewhat, yeah, somewhat charming, <laughs> like somewhat interesting, like- those people will never know. Every relationship that they get into, they've got it in the back of their mind go, do they really want to date me? Or do they want to date what I do for a living? So the third book is all about that, all about what I discovered, how I watched those. I'm not going to name names, sure. but people can put two and two together. Mm -hmm. And again, I lived in Malibu. There's nothing special about me. I fed people and I left them alone. If you feed people and you don't ask them for anything, sooner or later, they want to reciprocate. They they want to, well, I would imagine the food has to be good. And I would imagine you have to have good intentions and not be some fucking weirdo. But if you're a halfway decent person, which I am, and I feed people really amazing stuff, which I do, and I leave them the fuck alone, which I definitely do, right? Sun Life, in the training manuals of Sun Life, everyone is instructed. If a day laborer or a housekeeper or or a plumber, you know, whatever comes in, you treat them like they're a rock star. You treat them like they are an A-lister. Ooh, I love that. If an A-lister or a rock star comes in, which they're going to all the fucking time, every day, you treat them like they're a plumber. You treat them like they're a day laborer. Not you don't treat them well. You treat everybody well because everybody is just as important, but you specifically avoid any type of flattery, any type of like over the top, you know, whatever. You leave them alone. You never, ever, ever, ever ask them about their work. Dude, if you do that, and that's why they keep coming into your store because they're not met with that. And when you treat them as fucking humans, it, it, it changes them and they'll continue to come back and then you'll have an actual real connection with them yep you're not just fucking bothering them that's awesome it's the only place on the planet you'll see maria shriver and lady gaga waiting in line for anything mm -hmm. those people don't wait in line anywhere and we go out of our way to make sure that they feel good and they feel comfortable and they feel safe and part of that is with the exception of Rick Rubin. <laughs> Rick, when Rick walks in the, the the sea parts and we race outside and see what he wants. That's and, fair. Yeah, but everybody else, for the most part, maybe maybe there's a few people who I love up a little bit more so than others, but the, the, the training manual specifically states, you know, treat everybody like they're rock stars unless they are, and if they are, treat them like they're a normal person. And And that's what I did. And as a result, yeah, I got invited as sit at probably 50 different UFC fights front row. I got to fly around the world more times than I could count. I got to go and experience things like been to Monte Carlo and San Tropez and um, all those fancy, like I always say Capri, but I think it's Capri, whatever, sure. whatever it is. Yeah. Went to those places on yachts and all that stuff. And no matter how hard I tried, to find deep meaning in it, no matter how hard I tried to wrestle away some sort of piece of something that is unattainable unless you're at that level, it's not there. It's not there. There was a lot of boredom. There was a lot of pomp. 
There was a lot of circumstance and there was a lot of me witnessing people have to live these lives in cages. I don't want to live in a cage. Nope. I've been locked up multiple times. Mm, that's I, true. I don't want, I don't want to, I, even if the bars are golden and even if the bars are, are, you know, fortune and fame, I don't want that shit. I want to move. I move unencumbered. I'm free. Well, there you go. I think this is a great place to write. We went for a little bit there. They're fucking Rogan style. Chatty Kathy over I here. I love it. Thank you for coming on today, brother. Of course, man. Sun Life Organics. California locations. We've got one here in Austin, one in Miami. Yeah. Miami, September. Miami in September. Yeah. Is there anywhere else besides out in Cali? Uh, Summerlin is April. Yeah, Summerlin, a- Nevada, right outside of Vegas. So if you're in Cali and haven't been, go to sunlifeorganics.com. Yeah. I mean, you can go to sunlifeorganics.com. It's to not- find a location near oh, you. Yes. Go yeah. to sunlifeorganics.com, find a location um, near you. Or just put it in Google Maps. Yeah. Um, Books, best places, Amazon. Just, you know, I forgot to die and remembering to live. Um, I think that's about it. I mean, you can look at my Instagram. I'm I'm hyper focused now on just being more authentic and less silly, humble bragging and, you know, trying to look cool. Like when I look back a year and a half ago of what I was posting, it may, it makes me fucking cringe. Will you keep keep that on there though? Don't erase those. Don't delete them. I I look back at the pictures and I cringe. I look back at the posts when I read the posts. They're actually beautiful. Great. I'm literally saying like, this is not my jet. This is not my penthouse. This is not my vacation. I'm the lucky recipient of being an invited guest. None of this shit is going to truly make you happy. I'm living this now and I know it looks good on Instagram, but trust me, if you have someone that loves you, you won. Mm. If you have someone that you love and they love you, you won, right? Yeah. If you've got a dog, a cat, a, a son, a daughter, you know, people that you enjoy spending time with, you won. That's it. You know, have yeah. a barbecue, hug your kids, look your wife in the eye and say, you are the most important human being on this planet for me. And just, that's it. You won. There's nothing better than that. Yeah. Perfect. And the, re, the I only speak from experience. I, I have some cringeworthy posts from back like 2017 and mm-hmm. before, and I keep them on as just a reminder. And I yeah. want people to know, like, yeah, this is a part of this is part of who I am. Yeah, you know, this is in there. I had to go through that just like I had to go through the drug stuff to understand what I need to understand. I am a deeply flawed human being. I lived a good chunk of my life without a moral compass. And being a detriment to society, um, I got sober. What I thought at the time was a very late stage in life. It's a fucking joke. Thirty three is really fucking young, but you don't know thirty three is really young until you're fifty one. Oh yeah, right. Yep. So I made a mess of my life. Got real blessed. Got real lucky. Had some amazing people come into my life. We didn't get to talk about Gus, but hopefully again on another one. Um, I had some amazing people step in and become kind of surrogate parents for me. Um, Lastly, my my old boss, Michael Cartwright, who did fire me for good reason, um, he had a massive impact on my life. So there's been some great people, some great mentors, and I just I found a tiny little beat, a tiny little piece of humility, and I fanned those flames and tried to stay humble and every morning do my little prayers and before every meal do my little prayers and just constantly keep that relationship going with God so I know that there's nothing I can't do. And, um, and yeah, this is part of my, my, my awakening. I mean, I'm going to look back five years from now and think about what a douchebag I was at 51, you know? <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know douchebag, but you'd be like, I didn't know shit at 51. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Which I think is beautiful. We yeah. need to keep evolving and changing and growing. And that's it. That's a wrap, brother. Love Thanks it. Thanks for coming on. I love you, man. Love you too, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome.